I work with California Seed Ranch, and I'm the current chair of the COHO Partnership. And for those of you who don't already know us, I would like to introduce Marianne King from Trout Unlimited, Mia Van Docto, also from Trout Unlimited, Mariska Obedzinski from California Sea Grant, Jessica Pollitz from the Sonoma Resource Conservation District, Katie Robbins from the Sonoma Resource Conservation District, and then John Green from the Gold Ridge RCD will be joining us soon, but um, collectively, we are the Russian River Coho Water Resources Partnership, and you can just call us the Coho Partnership. And we want to thank you very much for joining us today for our final officially NIFWIF National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funded meeting. So thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna give you just kind of a quick rundown of how we're gonna spend the next few hours. First of all, we're gonna get into some partner summaries that just sort of wrap up our work. We're gonna include an overview of accomplishments, a funder's perspective on this project from our contract manager at NIFWIF, a multi-year overview of hydrologic conditions on a number of Russian River streams, and our observations on the impacts of the current drought on salmonids in our watershed. Then we're gonna discuss the critical need for watershed scale approaches to restoration. And here's some of the key lessons that we've learned over these past dozen years or so. And then I'm really excited. We have a guest panel that's joining us. A number of our esteemed agency partners are gonna um, share with us their thoughts on the opportunities and visions for the future of flow restoration. And then we're just gonna do a quick wrap up just before four o'clock. So I believe Katie has posted a downloadable version of this in the chat and it actually has approximate start times and breaks as well. So you may wanna download that to refer to it. And especially if you're coming and going in the meeting at all. And then in terms of questions, we do plan to leave a few minutes for questions at the end of each presentation. So go ahead and add them to the chat and we will do our very best to get to them. So I'm gonna start with an overview of the key partnership accomplishments. And I also wanted to let you know that we have just drafted a short glossy style report that covers this information and um, in a little more detail as well. And we'll be setting that out in about a week. So first of all, to offer the proper context, I wanted to step back to 2009. That was the year that swine flu was declared a global pandemic. Australia experienced the deadliest fires in their history. Obama was inaugurated as the 44th president. And the G20 summit was called to discuss the global financial crisis. And a little more relevant to us here in our watershed and the surrounding region, we were experiencing severe drought conditions for the third consecutive year. Some of you may remember at this time that wells were starting to run dry and people were getting really stressed out. Stranded fish were becoming more and more common sites to those of us that were walking the streams as these dry stream reaches just continued to expand their really bleak and dismal range. So even though we didn't have the empirical evidence to back it up, it was becoming really undeniable to anybody who was paying attention that stream flow impairment was a definite limiting factor to our native fish and a critical threat to our efforts to recover a self-sustaining population of Russian River coho. Nonetheless, while the restoration community had been implementing a whole slew of habitat improvements for well over a decade, insufficient stream flow was simply not being addressed. And in my recollection, it was just, you know, it was being discussed, but it was a little bit more of kind of a back room conversation. And there really seemed to be a kind of dominant social climate of water rights phobia and a clear obvious reluctance by landowners to engage in conversations with the resource agencies about their water use, much less the potential impacts of that use on an endangered species, especially in the midst of all these mounting well wars. So it was a little bit messy for sure. And it was really obvious to us folks in the trenches that the challenges inherent to restoring stream flow combined with the socio-political complexity surrounding human water use, really kind of presented the need for a non-regulatory 
multidisciplinary team dedicated to this endeavor in order to have any chance of success. Enter the Russian River Coho Water Resources Partnership. So the partnership is a team of restoration practitioners, water rights specialists and scientists, and we all work in close collaboration to increase flow in salmon bearing streams while improving water security for local landowners. And our group is comprised of individuals from Trout Unlimited, sorry, uh, the local RCDs, California Sea Grant Salmon and Steelhead Monitoring Program and Occidental Art and Ecology Center's Water Institute. And some of you may remember our original hydrology team actually was through the Center for Ecosystem Management and Restoration. And when that organization dissolved, um, our hydrology team was incorporated into Trout Unlimited. So thank you to you. And each of our organizations plays a unique role within the partnership. So collectively, we form a symbiotic team um, able to tackle the many diverse aspects of flow enhancement work. And the partnership was literally built on a unique funding opportunity provided by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And I wanna give a big shout out to NIFWIF and also a nod to two incredible individuals that were working with NIFWIF back at that time in 2009, Jim Siddell and Claire Thorpe. And so once Jim and Claire were familiarized with the situation by some of our founding members um, who kind of caught their attention, they seem to immediately understand the, the very, very uh, dire need for a coordinated flow restoration effort in the watershed. And our vision aligned with their business plan and Keystone initiatives as FEMCA is going to touch on. And they saw potential in our group and in the value of this work for Russian River Salmonid Recovery. And they took a leap of faith in our program and made a long-term investment in our collaboration. So NIFWIF has continued to fund us every year since then through 2021, actually through like now, the end of this month. And over that time, Sonoma Water has consistently provided substantial matching funds to make all the work that we've done possible. And it's really this programmatic, relatively flexible, long-term funding that has allowed us to grow into a solid organization and really enabled everything we've learned and accomplished over the last dozen years or so. So fast forward back to present day and since our birth date, we have unfortunately experienced far worse pandemics, far deadlier and larger fires, both in Australia and in the Western US. And I'm not even gonna touch on the financial crisis, but notably our region of California has experienced exceptional drought. 2021 was the driest year on record for nearly a century. And according to tree ring records, this has been the driest 22 year period in 1200 years. So experts say that places us in a mega drought. So you can see, despite the flow improvements made by the partnership, we have basically been fighting an uphill battle of increasing water scarcity and the need for flow restoration work is more critical than ever before. But as for us, our partnership is still hanging tough. We feel that our relationships, our knowledge, and our stream flow, pro stream flow projects are stronger than ever, but um, our future is rather uncertain at this time as our programmatic funding draws to a close. We have experienced many, many challenges, um, learned some hard lessons, um, had some accomplishments that we feel really good about, and I'm gonna highlight some of those for you today. And it turns out synthesizing 12 years of impacts and activities into like 18 slides is kind of challenging. So I apologize in advance for some rather text heavy slides. So one of the main strengths of the partnership approach is that it is grounded in science. So we collect and evaluate empirical data to gain an understanding of hydrological, biological and environmental conditions. And then we use that information to guide our decision-making. And our strongest data set comes from our robust hydrologic monitoring program. We have established the largest network of flow gauges in Russian river streams. We have more than 30 sites that we gauge at on nine different streams. And many of those gauges have been in operation for over a decade. Our hydrology team collects discharge measurements at every one of these sites, and then they use those to develop rating curves and develop continuous flow data sets. 
And those data are actually the only consistent documentation of flow conditions in existence for nine of the highest priority salmon streams in the Russian River Basin. And then we also conduct groundwater monitoring at four sites to gain an understanding of ground to surface water dynamics, which helps to guide our flow enhancement efforts. And it is not just us who rely on these data. Resource agencies and many others depend on these data to fill a critical gap. And it's kind of amazing when you think of all of the things these data teach us, like in addition to documenting flow status and trends, which is inherently important, uh, these data are really key in sleuthing out like flow impacts, what's happening out there in the, in the streams, opportunities, informing recovery actions and outcomes supporting research, and in particular, I think the long-term records are really invaluable in documenting hydrologic responses to changing climatic conditions, to natural disasters and other events over time. So the NIFWIF funding for operating these gauges has effectively ended, but some of them will be funded for the next one to two years through Wildlife Conservation Board grants. So after this month, a number of them will be unsupported, but then all of them will eventually in the next few years need funding for ongoing long-term operation. Partnership organizations have also been documenting some on a distribution, abundance, survival, and habitat conditions in Russian River streams for nearly two decades. And I wanna make clear, this is part of multiple Samana recovery efforts, not simply the NIFWIF funded efforts. We've also been quantifying late summer available wetted habitat since 2012 in order to estimate the impact of flow impairment on juvenile salmonids. And we've conducted some specialized studies, a couple in particular to investigate not only the influence of flow related habitat parameters on coho summer survival in an effort to try to figure out how much water these fish really need to survive, but also looking again at the influence of those parameters on fish growth, movement, and behavior to really try to understand how much water they need to thrive, and also to document the responses of fish in their habitat to increase stream flow. Among other things, research that has been either completed or supported by the partnership has really helped to broaden our understanding of the impacts of both flow impairment on rearing salmonids as well as outmigrating salmonids during the springtime in Russian River streams, and then key environmental factors that influence dry season survival of rearing salmonids, including the importance of pool connection, and then also kind of sleuthing out the amount of flow that's required to keep pools connected in high priority stream reaches as well as the, as the effects of flow augmentation. Our research has also highlighted the value of small scale flow improvements and allowed us to forecast local drought conditions early in the season. And much of our work has been encapsulated into peer reviewed journal articles. And we've made a point to really disseminate that information broadly because our goal is to contribute to the collective scientific knowledge of salmon habitat needs, hydrology and stream flow restoration throughout California and hopefully beyond even. In addition, the partnership has either developed or contributed data to modeling efforts that relate God, numerous things, fish survival to environmental metrics that really could predict the extent and distribution of stream drying under variable climactic conditions that evaluate the cumulative impacts of water rights in subwatersheds that predict the outcomes of a variety of different flow enhancement project scenarios and that help to guide restoration project planning and prioritization. So really the main point here is that our data support a suite of tools that are intended to help resource managers to plan recovery actions and also to respond to changing environmental conditions. And it's really our goal to take all this scientific information that we've collected and grown over time and move it into action. And one way that we have done this is to use what we've learned from our monitoring and modeling efforts to prioritize projects with a general approach of targeting stream reaches that have the greatest potential for improving marginal flow conditions in areas that also have the highest fish use. And our objectives are always twofold. 
So we're always striving to increase flow in salmon and steelhead bearing streams while increasing water reliability for our community members. And we work directly with landowners to develop voluntary projects. We use a variety of strategies and to date the majority of our projects have focused on water conservation and on storage and forbearance. But we also do implement upland drainage and infiltration projects. And as you'll soon hear from Brock, we just um, definitely want to take a moment to acknowledge the critical need for more of those types of projects in conjunction with continuing to address these smaller diversions in order to restore hydrologic function at a watershed scale. And so we're always looking for opportunities to do more of that work. And another unique strength of our partnership is that we have a really knowledgeable water rights specialist that works with our RCD project teams to navigate the water rights process and all the fun little legalities required to permit and um, legally you know, address these projects. So to date, we have completed 37 flow projects on five high priority salmon streams in the lower Russian River Basin. And collectively, these projects save just under 7 million gallons of water from being withdrawn from streams and near stream wells every summer in perpetuity. In addition, the flow releases that the partnership has supported in collaboration with agency partners and private landowners also collectively contribute over one cubic foot per second to summer stream flow. And I could see how that might not sound like that much to some of you, but relatively, these are really substantial contributions to streams in our system. Um, our coho rearing streams that have been the focus of our work have average summer base flows of just around 0.15 CFS and far less during dry years with many stream reaches commonly dropping to zero flow. So it's really no surprise, but it is always really rewarding to know that our monitoring data have also provided empirical evidence that many of our projects have directly improved in-stream flow and habitat connectivity. And so we know that they've increased the probability of survival for rearing salmon and steelhead. And then we've also used the scientific, the technical and the social knowledge that we've gained to draft stream flow improvement plans, also known as SIPs, and these outline you know, flow status, limitations, and specific strategies for flow enhancement in four high priority coho streams in the lower Russian River watershed. And then partnership organizations have also authored or contributed to several reference documents that inform a broad array of related subjects, everything from roof, roof water harvesting to water rights to frost protection permitting. And then along the way, we've also developed or refined some practical tools for the flow restoration community, like custom built data collection devices and interactive web tools. And I think many of you here have used our web applications that enable you to customize views of our near real time data in order to answer questions and plan your adaptive actions. And then we've also innovated some project features that increase the efficiency of flow projects. A couple of those are we've custom designed rainwater tanks to increase increase catchment capacity, and then kind of in a whole different arena, um, our members have worked with the county to address tax disincentives for rainwater installation tanks. And then another cool benefit of having a relatively flexible funding source for so many years is that it's allowed us to offer really robust outreach and support to our watershed community. Between all of our monitoring work, our project development, and our educational efforts, we've actually reached more than 10,000 community members directly through outreach and meetings and conversations. And we always really make a point to disseminate educational information to our community at every opportunity in many different formats. And really this sort of programmatic approach has also allowed us to be way more responsive in addressing community needs due to unforeseen events that by now should be foreseen, like wildfire and droughts. And um, unfortunately, there have been many of those since our inception. Over the years, we've also been happy to be able to offer fairly extensive support to our professional partners too. So um, at their request, we have provided technical input and other resources to help with a number of different planning and assessment efforts. 
we have shared real-time data directly with our agency partners to help inform in-season actions like fish rescues and other actions generally related to low flow conditions. We have assisted local government agencies with wildfire and drought response. And one of the really fun things that we've had the opportunity to do is provide direct support for other groups that are working on coordinated flow enhancement efforts throughout coastal California. And that's just been really rewarding for us to be able to pass on some of what we've learned. And I also think it's important to mention that one of the reasons that we've been able to accomplish so much in addition to sort of our, our core grant deliverables for NIFLIF is um, through compounding our efforts and also working to maximize resourcefulness and efficiency, we've actually been able to leverage the funds that we receive from NIFWIF to nearly quadruple the impact in the watershed. And the vast majority of that additional funding that was leveraged uh, came from the Wildlife Conservation Board. So big heartfelt shout out to the WCB for how incredibly important their funding has been to our research and to California flow recovery overall. And we also want to acknowledge that the WCB funded projects that we're currently engaged in are allowing the partnership to continue some level of active collaboration at this time, this transitional time. So that's really important to us. So by now I've kind of made it painfully clear that the programmatic funding from NIFWIF and Sonoma Water that has supported us for the past dozen years ends now. And many years of hard work have led to strong relationships and notable gains in scientific knowledge as well as flow improvements. But obviously, a ton of work remains to be done to restore sufficient stream flow in our region. And I think we can all agree that that work is more important than ever as we face increasing water scarcity due to climate change. Um, for now, the partnership is continuing to pursue project-based funding through WCB grants and other sources, but we're also really continuing to search for opportunities for funding that will allow us to work in a similar capacity as we have been, because we really think that allows us to provide the greatest possible contributions. And we believe that effective stream flow restoration really requires a great broad diversity of tools and approaches. And in our experience, programmatic funding allows for the relative flexibility that we need to develop and apply those tools as we learn and as the work evolves. So in closing, I wanted to acknowledge that the Russian River watershed lies in the ancestral and unceded lands of the Pomo, Wapo, and the Coast Miwok peoples. And just take a moment to honor the deep and enduring connection to this land by these original inhabitants and by their descendants as well. And uh, we wanted to say that as a partnership, we've really drawn inspiration from their thoughtful stewardship of this place. And we just feel incredibly fortunate to have this huge list of partners to thank everyone from private landowners to many, many professional partners that have really supported us on many levels over the past dozen years or so. And we're well aware that this work would not be happening without them. Um, we really value these partnerships tremendously. And we're also aware that salmon recovery and ecosystem restoration are only possibly going to be achieved through the engagement and commitment of all stakeholders. And so we're really grateful to be part of such an amazing and dedicated community. Thank you. And I believe Jessica, we have um, a little time for questions if there are any questions in the chat. Um, so far there's no questions, but if anyone has any, feel free to type them in. Okay, well, that's fine. And if we don't have any questions, oh, I'm sorry, it looks like Linda has a question. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Wonderful, this is so impressive to see. And um, I'm just <clears throat> completely struck by the programmatic funding and what it's done for you. And, you know, just to say how, um, I'm sure you put thought to it, but how can we continue to, I mean, this is a great presentation to get the word out about what can, what's possible with programmatic funding and how can we continue to um, leverage that and speak to the agencies to, to hear us? 
That's a great question, Linda. Um, we've actually had a lot of these conversations with different agency funders, and um, they often, their hands are just tied by either bond funding restrictions or other sort of um, parameters that limit the capacity in which the funds can be spent. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to keep having these conversations and keep, you know, making these needs clear. I do see, or it does seem like maybe there are more increasing opportunities with flexibility with some drought funding that's come down recently. Um, and I think we need to have more solid, dependable um, sources that allow for that. I mean, we, I think many of us would agree. Um, and I don't know, I think we should talk to our, our funding agencies more, um, keep being the squeaky wheels about this. We're also starting to explore opportunities with private foundation funders, um, but we really haven't broken through into that yet for this work. And obviously legislatures, legislators too. So yeah, um, it'd be nice if they were on the call today. <laughs> yeah, you know, and also the um, Salmon and Steelhead Coalition has been speaking with the legislature and I believe they, um, and policymakers in general, and I believe they have been also sharing this message about the need for, you know, as we have this need to like greatly increase the pace, the scale and the scope of flow restoration work, if mm -hmm. we're ever gonna have any chance of saving our, our native salmon, um, that we really need more flexible, more stable, dependable um, funding and also, you know, policies that support it. Thank you. All right, we have another question from Matt O'Connor. Um, what is the general shape and scope of activity in the absence of NIFWA funding? Um, Matt, we're currently just working through some grants that we have obtained through the Wildlife Conservation Board and um, perhaps some other smaller sources, but really we're working collectively. We're kind of, we're trying to work together as a partnership. It's not entirely the whole team. And we're really brainstorming ways that we can continue to like share information and collaborate. Um, and right now, <laughs> that's actually a question that we are mulling over as a group. And we have a visioning meeting um, to really talk about like strategies moving forward because what we're realizing is that it, right now it's impossible for us to continue in the capacity in which we have been. You know, we're having trouble um, supporting a chair role, supporting regular meetings, supporting um, kind of just this robust communication that has allowed us to, um, you know, strategize and um, implement and plan and outreach and everything else that we've done, including provide support for agencies and um, other partners. And yeah, it, we're skeletal right now, really. I think we have time for one last question from Lisa McKelly. Would it be possible for the monitoring work to be continued under an expanded monitor, monitoring collaboration, say via the R3MP effort of the Water Quality Control Board? It has a salmonid habitat focus plus harmful algal plumes. Um, yeah, I think that's a little bit of a more in-depth question, or at least from, from what I'm hearing, like we would if there are opportunities to fund people to do continued monitoring, um, then yeah, it would be possible to take the framework that we've built and continue that monitoring. Um, we often talk about whether or not we need to be like monitoring in perpetuity to answer some of our questions. But I think at this time, continued monitoring would really benefit us because what we're seeing is that um, the climate change that is affecting our environmental conditions locally and beyond is really um, not only changing our hydrologic patterns, but it's also changing patterns in fish distribution. So we think this is a really critical time to continue robust monitoring efforts to really be able to kind of um, appropriately plan and prioritize and um, yeah, address, address this issue effectively. So yeah, let's talk <laughs> more about that. And I think that's all we can take for right now, just to stay on track. Although if we have time at the end, we could perhaps revisit some questions. And um, so FEMCA will be speaking next. FEMCA Freiburg is the NIFWIF California Water Programs Manager and has also been administering this 
grant for us. So thank you, Femka, for being willing to speak to your experience as a funder in this process. Sure, and can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks so much. I'm Femka Freiberg. Um, I'm Program Director for Western Water for NIFWIF, and so excited to just share a little bit about NIFWIF's experience with this initiative and um, some of our thoughts on coho recovery moving forward. Um, oopsies. There we go. Um, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with NIFWIF, um, we're an independent nonprofit organization. However, we were chartered by Congress. And so as part of that charter, we have a 30 member board that is actually appointed by the Secretary of Interior. And it includes two standing positions for the Director of US Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA Administrator. Um, so a bit different than other uh, funders. We are primarily a conservation grant maker. We're actually the largest conservation grant maker in the US. Um, and so we do that by bringing together federal funding with other private and other sources to put it on the ground to actually implement conservation projects. And we do not engage in lobbying or litigation. And just to kind of give a sense of the, the scope of our investments, we invest all over uh, the United States. So um, we're kind of everywhere, um, including the Russian River. So um, just to kind of do a brief overview, and my, my timeline and kind of going back in time is not nearly as colorful or exciting and interesting as Sarah's, but I wanted to kind of just share NIFWF's engagement in the Russian River. Um, so you all know likely that 2005, COHO were listed as endangered, and then in 2008, NOAA um, release their draft recovery plan. And so 2009, the following year is when NIFWIF launched our Russian River Coho initiative and published our 12-year uh, business plan for Russian River Coho recovery. Um, and at that time, the baseline for adult returns to the Russian was 20. And we set kind of our goal, our 12-year goal to be 600 adult Coho returns. Um, and so over the course of the past 12 years, we, we did an assessment in 2012 to kind of check how are things going, are they on track, determine they were, and of course, um, that assessment was followed by a very severe drought, um, and then, you know, numbers started to go up again, and we, we hit that 600 mark, um, 2018, and in 2019, we did a, a second assessment of the initiative, um, and that assessment and the findings from that really helped contribute to the decision to close the business plan, um, which was kind of officially closed in 2020. But as Sarah mentioned, this the kind of the final funding is still being spent, um, you know, through probably the end of this month. Um, so the business plan, uh, when it was laid out, was really had this aim to demonstrate that we could increase juvenile coho over summering and over winter survival, um, in addition to overall adult coho abundance by changing the way water is managed um, and trying to leave more water in stream. So, you know, NIFWIF recognized full recovery was projected to be decades in the future and depended on many um, strategies uh, to recover the species, but changing water management was identified as a niche that NIFWIF could fill to kind of mitigate or direct threat to the coho population at the time. So um, it's kind of important to note that this, uh, there was an underlying hypothesis to the entire business plan that water for both humans and coho could be secured through careful planning and water supply management. So that was really the, um, the focus of the business plan. And so, uh, like I said, in 2009, we published the plan. Um, there was a very specific goal to conserve two CFS, two CFS of water per year, and that was a target that NIFWIF was aiming to um, kind of hit with our investments. And then there was another goal um, around uh, ramping up the broodstock program, and this was really kind of a recognition that our part funding partners would be focused on that, so Sonoma Water and and all of the folks involved in Thorm Springs Hatchery um, would be kind of continuing to support the broodstock program. And that with the collective efforts that were going into the basin, 
uh, there would be kind of a very specific species target of 600 adult returns uh, over the course of the business plan implementation. And so the key strategies in the plan were water management, of course, to increase summer stream flow, monitoring uh, was another really important component that NIFWF set out to support with our investments. And then there was recognition that our funding partners would be supporting um, really you know, key in stream and riparian restoration work as complementary efforts. And then of course the population augmentation work uh, happening at the hatchery. So um, many of you are probably all familiar with this, but the business plan also um, had a focus on five key kind of sub basins, Grape Mill, Dutch Bill, Green Valley, and Mark West. And so that was from the beginning, we said we're gonna focus on these specific sub basins with our efforts. Um, so I, Sarah taught, talked a lot about the accomplishments of the partnership. So. Um, I'm not even going to try to talk about all of the great success over the time period we've invested, but I'm kind of fast forwarding to um, the closure of NIFWF's engagement with the Russian River Coho Initiative. So, like I mentioned, in 2019, we did an internal assessment of the program um, and found that the species goal that had been set in the business plan originally of 600 returning adult coho was reached. Um, that the budget that was put aside for the business plan of $6 million had been fully awarded and that was leveraged by over $10 million in grantee match. And as you've just heard, even more uh, money and kind of additional funds that were leveraged. So the 10 million was just direct match that was brought uh, forward by the partners. And then the assessment also found that all of, really all of the strategies that were laid out in the business plan had been successfully implemented. So everything from the monitoring programs to um, the stream flow improvement plans to a really a proof of concept of an array of water management, uh, water conservation strategies um, had been achieved. And there was this robust pipeline of, of projects that were um, kind of ready to go, or at least in planning phases moving forward. Um, and then another really important part of the conversation around closure of the business plan was NIFWF's organizational move from these kind of species focused um, kind of watershed based business plans to broader landscape scale planning. And uh, so there was a decision to develop a California forest and watersheds business plan and uh, a lot of discussion about how the work in the Russian river could be integrated and support um, kind of a, a more broader landscape scale business plan um, for the state of California. And so that's where NIFWF is now moving um, with our coho recovery efforts in California. So that kind of brings me to this business plan. Um, and we've been working on this for almost two years now. Uh, and it was actually just approved by our board in November. And it's kind of being polished up by our communications folks, and I think should be live on our NIFWF website either this month or early next month. Um, but it's our California Forest and Watersheds business plan. The goal is to protect and restore California's forest and watersheds from headwaters to the coast, to advance species conservation and landscape resilience to future fire, drought, and other stressors. So um, the idea behind this plan is that uh, it will really work from the headwaters down to kind of integrate the investments that NIFWF has been making in the state of California for many years, um, our watershed work as well as our forest work. Um, and, and kind of look, we looked really across the entire state to see where were um, kind of landscape level uh, change could be affected and particularly around species where we thought that our investments could make an actual kind of numerical um, benefit to key species of concern in the state. So um, the focal species that are listed in the business plan and kind of the focal geographies are captured on this slide. And this is a very high level um, overview. So the map you'll see the black outline um, is the footprint of the business plan. So that's kind of the entire reach of, of where we're planning, you know, our investments over the next 10 years. And then the orange areas are focal areas where we actually have 
developed kind of species level metrics and targets um, that we will seek to kind of monitor and, and work to achieve. And those areas include, you know, coastal watersheds, as well as headwater forests in Sierra Nevada and agricultural lands in uh, the Central Valley. And we're really selected kind of an array of factors, including where there's alignment with our federal and private funding partners, um, where our science team found that we could kind of affect real change on species numbers, and um, as well as kind of where uh, the strategies were ripe for implementation. So there's kind of a whole array of things that went into determining those focal geographies. Um, and then the species as well, um, you can kind of see there's a list here, it includes coho. The, um, the 10 year business plan goals for coho are focused on Sonk coho, Southern Oregon, Northern California coast. And so, um, and you can see kind of from the map that I just showed um, there's, we're anticipating a lot of the investment on coho recovery. Um, in particular, at least the, the investments where we'll be kind of like counting toward our metrics to be in the Klamath Basin and the Trinity River and Eel River. Um, but uh, this is, this business plan, as you can see, you know, this is just for the freshwater ecosystem. So there's a whole nother set of metrics for forest ecosystems as well. So um, it's just, a much more kind of expansive uh, plan for, for our investments across the state. Um, and then just to give you a sense of the implementation strategies, and you'll recognize the folks in um, this water conservation photo. And I wanted to share this because uh, one of the really important things that, you know, we discussed a lot at NIFWIF when we were closing our engagement with the Russian River um, Initiative is what are really the key takeaways for NIFWIF and how can we involve those in our you know, California business plan. So one is that you know, water conservation, water management is a critical strategy for freshwater ecosystems in the state. And that's you know, in so many parts of the state, it's um, a worthwhile strategy that we plan to continue to support. Um, and we'll also be um, supporting meta restoration work kind of more typical habitat restoration. So definitely continue looking at rearing habitat for coho um, and then connect watershed connectivity work. So that's aquatic organism passage. Um, there's kind of an array of stuff we'll be doing on forest roads, floodplain reconnection um, and kind of all the things that you can do to restore watershed function through connectivity. Um, so those are some of the key strategies that we'll be supporting moving forward. Um, and then as far as uh, the Russian River, uh, you know, Russian River is definitely well within the, the business plan footprint for California. Um, we actually just finalized a partnership with NRCS uh, where we are going to be able to support some forest land specialists in the Russian River to work with landowners um, to, to improve resiliency for fires and and also um, improving resiliency of kind of forest land fires in a way that will also benefit watershed health. So how you can kind of, how we can support projects that can kind of do both in, in you know, the resilience to fire and drought, essentially. Um, and then we've been busy trying to develop corporate partnerships to kind of bring more funding for water management and stream flow restoration. Um, and, you know, we're always sharing the great success of the partnership um, in the Russian River with, you know, all the different projects that have been implemented and uh, hopeful that there will be more potential funding through corporate partnerships for NIFWIF to be able to support those more of those projects moving forward. Um, so, you know, definitely look forward to continuing to engage with folks on the Russian and beyond in California as we continue to um, support coho recovery in the state. And from the NIFWIF side, you know, even though I know the, the outlook is very bleak often with um, Pacific salmon, uh, it, does, it does seem like the Russian River is certainly a bright spot in that. And um, that's thanks to all the hard work of partnership and, you know, many of the folks on this call. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, of course, and um, we're just hopeful that we can keep building on, the, you know, the momentum that 
you all have developed and and hopefully set goals that are that are more than just basic survival, but we can start setting goals toward thriving of different, at least, um, you know, subpopulations of coho. So I will leave it there and open it up to any questions. Thank you, Femka. I'm super excited to hear more about this California Forest and Watershed Business Plan. I I love that it's so expansive and frankly ambitious because I think that's what we need. So it's, yeah, it's really exciting to hear about. And I think if we don't have any um, burning questions right now, this would be a good time to take a break. Do we, I'm sorry, I haven't been screening the chat, but Jessica, is there anything kind of pressing that would be quick or? Um, there's nothing pressing, but one leftover question from, I think your talk, Sarah, was, Given your experience in the Russian River watersheds, can you state unequivocally that stream flow is the primary limiting factor for salmonid recovery and persistence in the Russian? I don't well, know. If that's <laughs> I was I was just writing a response, so if if you want me to take that, I can, Sarah. Sure, Mariska. Um, so Manfred, I guess I would never argue, you know, that there's one smoking gun unequivocally, but clearly in freshwater. Um, low flow conditions in some years are devastating and, and salmon are not able to complete their life cycle um, because of low stream flow. And we've seen that, especially this past year, it was hitting two life stages really hard. Smolts um, that are migrating out to the ocean in the spring, you know, a lot of streams were cut off from flow during that out migration, and that can just wipe out a whole year class really quickly. Um, so that in combination with, you know, the low flow that we, th that the fish experience in the summer, yeah, I mean, that can just totally wipe out a year class. So um, it, it, I'm not, I guess, I'm not comfortable saying it's like the one factor always in every year that's um, preventing recovery, but in a lot of years it is. All right, thanks Mariska. And I think if we're going to squeeze in even a quick break now, um, let's do that. Let's take um, five minutes. That'll give folks time for whatever quick bathroom run or something. Let's meet back here at 123. Thank you. Or to check your emails more like It started. I, hopefully everybody is back with us. Um, so Mia Van Docto from Trout Unlimited is, is now going to share with us the hydrologic monitoring overview from her gauging flow in Russian River streams over the last, uh, since 2010, I believe. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mia Van Docto. I'm a conservation hydrologist with Trout Unlimited. And today I'm going to be sharing some of the lessons that we've learned from our 12 years of hydrologic data collection in the Lower Russian River. Uh, I'm very excited to be giving this presentation, but it was also hard for me to put together because there's so much that could be covered. And with just 20 minutes, um, I'm really trying to give an overview and touch on some of the key lessons that we've learned. Um, and so first I wanted to start off by giving a shout out to the hydrology crew, um, who these are the people who are out in the field collecting the data, working on the data analysis, um, operating a gauge network the size that we do is a lot of work um, and these folks deserve a lot of credit. Um, this map shows our gauge network in the Russian River. Um, as Femka and Sarah mentioned, um, the main watersheds that the Coho Partnership focused on were Dutch Bill, Green Valley, Mark West, Mill, and Grape. And since the beginning of our partnership, we've also expanded the gauge network to cover Porter Creek and Pena. Um, so we're currently operating around 30 gauges in the Lower Russian. So I thought I'd start by giving kind of an overview of what stream flow conditions have been like over the past 12 years. This first graph shows stream flow conditions at the beginning of the partnership in 2010 and 2011. 
Um, this next graph shows stream flow conditions during the drought from 2012 to 2016. And so you can see stream flow conditions during the drought were significantly lower than they were in 2010 and 2011. And then this next graph shows stream flow conditions in 2017 through 2019, which you know, we think about as being post drought conditions. Um, and then this next graph shows conditions from 2020 and 2021. And so as you can see, and as you are probably already aware, the past two years have been very dry um, and drier than the last drought. So from this data, we can begin to understand some things. We can understand what some of the highest flows have been like over the period of record, as well as what median flow conditions are like and what the lowest flow conditions have been like. So this is an example from Green Valley Creek where in some of our higher years, we see stream flow conditions in May around five and a half CFS. And then in drought years, they're below 0.5 CFS. And in drought years, we've had um, reaches disconnect as early as late June, early July. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of context about the period our gauging record has been in. Um, over the past 12 years, we've had three years that were above average rainfall with nine years below average rainfall. Um, so that kind of paints a picture of where things have been and maybe also tells us a little bit about where things may be going um, with climate change. Um, one of the things Sarah mentioned was the pool connectivity thresholds that the COHO established, COHO partnership established as part of our stream flow monitoring and fish monitoring efforts. And so what we did was we identified a connectivity threshold for the different reaches and watersheds that the partnership has been working in. And then from that, we can estimate the number of days or the percentage of time that pools have been disconnected in those reaches. And Interestingly, when you look at it over the period that we've been studying stream flow, in a median year, we have disconnected pools 53% of the time. And in a dry year like 2021, we've had disconnected pools for 78% of the time. Um, I also wanted to share a little bit about some of our earlier accomplishments um, and the way that we've used the gauge data to identify um, projects, uh, monitor their effective and monitor their effectiveness. So this gauge shows stream flow conditions in the Dutch Bill Creek watershed in 2011 and 2012 in blue. And uh, you, many of you are probably familiar with the, these hydrographs, but you can see the dips in flow were times when the landowner was pumping water from the stream to irrigate a lawn. And then the partnership developed a water storage and forbearance project for them. And the purple line represents stream flow conditions after the project was developed. So you can see that the diversions have been removed. Um, and you know, prior to the project being developed, they were pumping the creek to the point of pool disconnection. Um, and so the, the gauge data has not only helped us identify projects, but it's helped us understand the effectiveness of those projects. Another way our gauge data has been um, useful is looking at flow releases. So we've got a number of flow releases that we've been studying in the Russian River watershed. This one is an example from Porter Creek where we set up a series of gauges downstream of the flow release. And with the gauge data, we can look at how the release um, is picked up as you move downstream and the loss of flow that occurs as you're moving from the flow release to the downstream reach, and especially in the areas that are alluvial, uh, dominated by alluvium. Um, the next thing that I wanted to highlight was the importance of, in, of the timing of rainfall on stream flow conditions and coastal streams. So you may remember in that rainfall graph I showed that rainfall conditions in 2017 were above median. But in 2017, it, the system experienced a pretty dry late spring and early summer. And so starting in May, well flows were higher than they, than they were in any other year during our period of record. Because we didn't get any rain events in May or June, 
we had below, we had really low stream flow conditions in July, August, September, and October. In contrast, 2019, which is, was a year that experienced below average rainfall, had this very large rain event that happened in late May. And that rain event increased summer base flow to a, the highest that we have on record. So the timing of rainfall events in coastal streams is really important to understanding what late summer base flow conditions are going to be. Another interesting thing that we've pulled out from the data is each watershed and gauge site has a sort of unique signature in the way that flows recede over time. And because we have 12 years of data, we can see what that signature looks like and use that signature to predict things like what late summer flow conditions may be like based on an early season summer or late season spring measurement. So last year, I developed that re regressional pattern to predict how flow, a flow measurement in late March could in, be an indicator for how low flows could be in um, June, July, in the late summer season. Um, and so this allowed us to uh, see that stream flow conditions in 2021 were not only going to be a drought year, but they were significantly lower than the 2012 through 2016 drought. So what I did is I, I've looked at how the predicted flow compares to the measured flow. And while it's not a perfect comparison, it was pretty accurate in estimating the timing of when pools might disconnect in the stream. So the graph above shows predicted stream flow with measured stream flow below and the timing of when um, the reach reached near dry conditions was pretty accurate. Um, I wanted to highlight a little bit about what the 2021 drought looked like across our project watersheds. Um, the, this is stream flow conditions in summer 2021. The orange line represents stream flow conditions in Mill Creek. The light blue line is stream flow conditions in Mark West Creek. The dark red line is stream flow conditions in Dutchville, and the, the uh, blue line is stream flow conditions in Green Valley Creek. So the point that I want to share is that stream flow conditions in Green Valley Creek were the lowest among the, the four watersheds. They were the highest in Mill Creek starting in the summer season. You can see in the hydrograph that there's a series of diversions that are happening in Mill Creek. Um, but stream flow conditions in Mark West Creek were the most stable throughout the summer season. Um, this is largely could be attributed to the fires that happened in Mill and Mark West Creek um, and the effects that they've had on the landscape. The other thing to note is that while Dutchville Creek was really low, it's hard to see it in this data, but there is a flow release project that happened in Dutchville Creek and that flow release was what kept the channel wetted through the majority or throughout the summer season. Um, so I'm gonna show a series of photos that show what stream flow conditions have been like in 2021 throughout the watersheds because I think it's visually helpful to see images rather than just hydrographs. So this is Mark West Creek. The photo on the left is stream flow conditions in May. They were around 1.12 CFS. And then in June, flows had receded to 0.24 CFS. And in August, flows had dropped about half of what they were in June to 0.1 CFS. And then in September, flows increased a little bit. Um, and here's stream flow conditions in the Mill Creek watershed with um, flows in April starting at around 1.6 CFS dropping to 0.32 CFS in June to 0.09 CFS in July, and the stream dried out um, by September. Here's what conditions look like in the Dutchville Creek watershed with stream flow starting at point, you know, around 0.5 CFS in May, dropping to 0 0.06, 0 0.06 CFS in June, and then um, reaching disconnection by July and the reach dried out by September. And then here's conditions in Upper Green Valley Creek. In May, 
conditions were around 1.2 CFS, and those had dropped to 0.1 CFS by June. And then by August, the reach had disconnected and had gone completely dry by September. So as Sarah mentioned, um, the funding from NIFWIF is going away. And so I wanted to share a little bit about the future of our gauge network. Right now, the get gauge network is continuing with funding through WCB, and we are really, really grateful for that. Um, through that funding, we're also making some updates and improvements to the gauge network. And this year, we're now monitoring winter base flows and partnering with OEI to monitor peak flows in the watersheds um, to get a better understanding of what, what winter stream flow conditions are like. Um, because I think that's a, a next important step for the partnership to understand how winter stream flow conditions might be like in the watersheds and how that, that could be impacting summer stream flow and coho survival. Um, we're also going to be um, putting in some of our systems. We're going to be telemetering some of our systems to get some stage data in real time. And we're going to continue to work on developing our stream flow core forecast to estimate um, the timing of when we might expect to see pools disconnect um, in drought years. And then another opportunity that's recently come up is um, analyzing temperature data to identify potential sources of groundwater um, in, in flow, inflow to the streams to understand where, uh, which reaches may be important for conservation. Um, and so, you know, we, we I wanted to point out that we need your help to continue the gauge network. I think it's a really um, important data source for the region. Um, almost, you know, almost 100% of our program is grant funded. So we really need funders to continue to fund the stream flow work that we're doing to see the value in our monitoring work um, and new grant opportunities to do purely scientific studies to look at their data to do a deeper analysis on the 12 years of data we now have. Um, and so some of the key lessons learned are the, the spatial distribution, the period of record, and the location of our gauges being on tributary streams makes the data that I've just shared really unique. And because of that, I think it's really valuable and important. Um, we've learned a lot from the data over the course of the 12 years. We've used the data to identify projects, to develop projects, to look at the, the effectiveness of those projects. We've developed ecological um, functions and metrics to, to stream flow conditions, such as the flow connectivity thresholds. And we've also used the data to um, under, better understand drought in the region, to predict drought, and to think about how to respond to drought going forward. And then lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge all the people who have worked on the gauge network over the past 12 years. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And since it's beginning, um, the, the network has you know, functioned through not only staff time, but also interns and volunteers over the years. I just wanted to give um, an acknowledgement to all the folks that have worked on our gauge network over the past 12 years. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Mia. It looks like we have time for just one question. Brock, do you have a question? Oh, you just, oh, you clapped, not raised your hand. Sorry, I got a little confused with the emojis. <laughs> okay. All right. In the absence of a question at this time, at least if you, if you, if anybody has questions along the way, feel free to add them to the chat. We'll see if we have more time at the end. But for now, let's move on to Troy's uh, presentation. Troy Cameron is a fish biologist with our California Sea Grant Russian River Salmon and Jailhead Monitoring Program. And his presentation is a little unique in that it's not specific to partnership completed work, but we wanted to share some of Sea Grant's observations of the impacts on this recent drought that we're, this current drought, I should say, that we're experiencing on salmonids that we thought you would all be really interested to hear. So Troy compiled that information and is going to share it with us. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
as Sarah mentioned, uh, looking at how um, drought impacted salmonids, I'm gonna kind of go through all the different life stages that we monitor. Um, this is gonna be really high level since really just don't have the time to go through in great detail all these things, but I encourage all of you to check out some of our uh, triennial reports if you have any real uh, data-driven questions and uh, see the bigger picture. Um, and yeah, again, like Sarah said, not entirely NIFA funded, co cobbled together uh, various sources because things were just so dire out there in 2021. So uh, to start, we can just uh, focus on the adults. Um, and so what we saw was not only low rainfall, but very late as well. So uh, this figure, you can see the gauge data from Austin Creek uh, outlined in red is the 2020-21 winter and you know, really small storm events and also really late. Um, and you can see how that compares to previous year's data in gray in the background. So kind of orders of magnitude, difference amount of rainfall. And so a uh, consequence of that was that um, coho salmon were delayed in accessing their typical spawning habitat streams uh, by about six weeks. Um, and the longer a fish is waiting, kind of the lower its fitness level and fecundity uh, suffers a bit. Um, it also meant that fish could access fewer streams. So we uh, observed coho in only 24% of the uh, streams that we surveyed, uh, which is definitely lower than usual. And there was also some interesting distribution of fish. Um, we observed 50% of our coho reds in Austin Creek, uh, just because that's one of the bigger systems that they could actually access on time, um, as opposed to some of our, what we think of kind of coho stronghold streams of Green Valley and Willow. We only observed one red in those streams. Um, so pretty stark difference from our usual patterns. Um, and with that said, even some of the reds that were successfully dug in our tributary streams, many of them dried out before the alevin even hatched out. And we saw adult stranding also occur through the winter. Um, and then for the smolts that were waiting to outmigrate that spring, um, they experienced significant early spring uh, stream disconnections uh, prior even to the peak of the small outmigration window. Um, it was the earliest mouth closures uh, of all the streams that we conduct downstream migrant trapping on. Uh, this includes Mill, Green Valley, Willow, and Dutchbill. And just kind of for context, uh, you know, we think of 2014-15 drought as kind of a benchmark for how bad things can be. Well, Mill Creek disconnected a month earlier even than that year. Um, so pretty brutal. And we generally had low trap numbers, uh, likely because fish were trapped upstream of the trap even. Um, so we weren't even getting them all the way to that location. And the figure at the bottom just kind of illustrates how early that disconnection happened and how it preceded the peak of that uh, migration window. These are um, antenna detections. And you can see by um, mid-April in Mill Creek specifically, uh, things were completely disconnected from Dry Creek. And a uh, consequence of that was that our downstream migrant trapping uh, turned into a relocation effort. Um, so as fish came into our uh, pipe traps, we loaded them into these uh, blue backpack bubbler um, barrels and moved them downstream of the lowest points of disconnection. And oftentimes that meant into the next water body available. So the Mill Creek fish went into Dry Creek, and, uh, Green Valley into Main Stem and so on um, because there's just uh, so much fragmentation in the lower reaches. Um, and yeah, we were just really doing this on the fly once we started to notice the disconnections uh, because not all of these uh, streams were getting wetted habitat surveys done regularly. Um, we kind of had to use our best judgment when to start these fish relocations. And in retrospect, we probably could have started even earlier than we did. Um, but without our intervention, you know, as many as 93% of the smolts in Mill Creek, just for example, uh, would have had no chance without uh, our intervention. And the graphic on the bottom right just kind of shows how many fish we were catching under these different um, stream flow conditions. So very few of our fish were coming into the trap during times where everything was fully connected. Um, and in Mill Creek, you know, it was just a small handful of fish and the rest of the time it was fully disconnected. So um, pretty rough for those smolts trying to get out to the ocean. Um, a lot of uh, hurdles along the way. And then going from our spring 
monitoring into our summer monitoring. Um, we do a lot of uh, what we call wet dry mapping. A lot of you have probably seen these maps over the years, but for those of you who aren't familiar, it's um, a hiking survey that we conduct mapping the presence or absence of surface water as a line feature. Um, and intermittency is defined as sections of kind of choppy back and forth, short sections of wet or dry. Uh, while we're out there, we're also collecting discrete temperature and dissolved oxygen measurements at five minute intervals, just to kind of randomize our samples and get a distribution throughout the reaches. Um, and we're sampling pool habitat specifically uh, for these water quality data. Um, these surveys are done anywhere from May through October. Um, albeit some of these have different goals. We had a few grant funded efforts in Pena, Mark West and Green Valley. So they received monthly surveys. Um, so as many as six samples through the summer. Um, but many of these other streams only received a one-time late season survey to kind of catalog what the lowest flow condition was for the year. And this is what it looked like uh, through the lower basin. Um, we conducted over 120 stream miles survey and included 45 streams, so pretty huge effort. And that 120 mile figure doesn't even include the repeat samples that we did. So once you factor those in, we did about 300 miles of wetted habitat surveys throughout the basin. So pretty exhaustive work. Um, but what you're seeing is just the driest in each stream. So anywhere from August to October, these took place. Um, so they're not exactly the same in time, but they should represent kind of the lowest flow. And once you average all those together, uh, what we see is 51% uh, of the habitat was still wet and flowing, 10% of it was intermittent, and 39% of it was completely dry. Um, so you might notice a little bit of distribution here. Um, there's some nice wet habitat clustered around the Upper East Austin Pena Mill system, um, but it has to be said that this was the site of the Wallbridge fire so well within the footprint of that event from fall of 2020. Um, and so as a result of, you know, many of those trees dying, that kind of releases a little bit of that uh, surface water for stream flow. So these are probably flowing a little bit better than they would have otherwise been under normal conditions. So um, yeah, basically things could have been worse. And even um, Mark West out here on the right, which is also pretty wet, um, also has been subject to fire in recent years. So um, there's an element of that kind of buffering these numbers. And some of you might've been thinking, oh, 51% wet, you know, doesn't sound so bad, a little bit above half, but this is really what we were seeing out there on a day-to-day -day basis was lots of dried out fish, um, lots of dried out equipment, and just, you know, these high water marks where this should be a nice deep pool on the bottom right. But, uh, uh, completely dry, so pretty bleak out there. And to do 300 miles of surface like this was a little rough on my soul. Um, but focusing down from our basin wide um, view into just our kind of life cycle monitoring broodstock streams, Dutch Bill, Green Valley, and Mill, and Willow. Um, once we look at these, they averaged only 28% wet habitat, 20% of it being intermittent, and 52 completely dry. And um, yeah, so looking at about like 50% each in Mill and Dutch Bill, just under 20% wetted habitat in Green Valley and Willow Creek was pretty, pretty catastrophically low. Only 3% of that habitat remained back through the summer. Um, so that was by and far the worst that we had documented. Um, and so, you know, what does this mean for the fish that were in the streams throughout the summer? Um, because even though they're mined on water, oftentimes it looked like this nasty green stuff here in Mill Creek and wasn't really, um, yeah, adequate to support fish. So um, to start with, just gonna talk a little bit about our, our distribution um, snorkeling surveys. So we do these each summer under the Coastal Monitoring Plan, CMP. These are conducted June through August and they kind of just get us a distribution and uh, some density of where the fish are as indicated by the size of the bubbles here. Um, and then we do our wetted habitat and I usually get our base flow samples August to October. And so this is what Mill Creek looked like by the end of September. Um, and then what we can do is kind of spatially join these and overlay these and turn into a map like this, where we see um, basically where our fish have a chance of surviving through the summer. Um, so lower, lower mill is a common spawning location and also a common area for things to try out completely. So those fish really 
a very little chance of surviving the summer. Delta Creek was also pretty bad. It's only in Upper Mill Creek and Palmer Creek that you really have any chance for these fish um, to survive. But I uh, don't have time to go through all the numbers, but basically the theme through the summer was that there were low numbers of fish to begin with. So some of these overlays don't really look that stark, but the, the message is that you're really not recruiting that many fish uh, through the summer, even where it is possible to retain a little bit of habitat. Um, we just don't have that many fish out there. And that's kind of driven home in this slide. Um, so looking at the numbers of fish in relation to wetted habitat um, across these same broodstock streams, only 30% of the fish were located in areas that stayed wet through the summer, 21% of that went intermittent and 49% was completely dry. And you'll see in Willow Creek, there is basically no wetted habitat available for fish to sustain them through the summer. Um, and like I said, it was just a small number of fish though, um, across these four streams, we're talking in the order of just 1,600 fish, uh, coho and juvenile, and steelhead juveniles um, as an unexpanded count. Um, so these are just 50% um, of the pools that were dove during the summer. Um, so 30% of that number leaves you basically not a whole lot of fish to recover a species. Um, so very, very unsuccessful recruitment through the summer. And so I also want to talk about the water quality. Um, so this is a Green Valley example, our June sample um, where things are starting to disconnect slightly, but still generally flowing and uh, connected. So we had an average of our dissolved oxygen measurements uh, just about six, 6.28. So that's a reasonable happy place for coho to rear in, like to be in kind of six to seven milligrams per liter ideally. But by the time our next July sample rolled around, that number had plummeted to 3.63 milligrams per liter. And you can start to see this widespread, uh, widespread disconnection throughout the stream as the habitat contracts. And we can go all the way to our last most dry survey in September. And all of a sudden uh, we're seeing only 2.51 milligrams per liter on average. Um, and these are samples that are taken in the wetted area. So um, yeah, even where there was water, it was pretty bad and not necessarily able to sustain fish through the entirety of the summer. And yeah, that, that really happened fast. It went from uh, being unsustainable basically in July all the way through September. So that's a few months of dealing with that, um, that kind of condition. So this isn't necessarily a mortality study, but it's really suggestive um, that most of those fish would have uh, perished under these conditions. Um, and so a question we get a lot is kind of how the 2015 drought compares to the 2021. So we have a um, bit of a random selection of 14 streams that were sampled in each of these seasons uh, to compare. And what we saw in 2015 was 44% of the habitat remained wet, 21% of it went intermittent and 35% of it was dry. Whereas in 2021, we had 40% of the habitat wet, 14% intermittent and 46% dry. Um, so if you just compare the wetted values, it doesn't seem like a huge difference. You know, 4% drop doesn't seem that significant, but a lot of the change happened in the intermittent and dry composition. So we gained 11% of completely dry habitat. And most of that came from um, what was intermittent became completely dry. So our intermittency dropped only 14% in 2021. Um, and again, these numbers are slightly buffered by fire influence. So um, if you look at the stream names, we have places like Gilliam, Gray, Mark West, Pena, Redwood Creek, all of these are places that experienced fire recently. And so uh, potentially were a little bit more wet than they otherwise would have been. Um, so those differences, differences could have been even starker. And yeah, this has been a bit of a theme. A lot of people have touched on this kind of cycle of drought. Um, I just called out Green Valley and Willow Creek here from 2014 to 21. Um, just to point out that even though these streams are pretty different in a lot, in a lot of ways, their morphology and their um, riparian zones and things like that, but there's a similar pattern that can be seen through these years where we kind of have a few years of not even at quite average rainfall, as Mia was pointing out, 
2017 maybe was above average, but it resulted in kind of average-ish stream flow during the summer months. Um, and 2019 um, was the one with the late rain that kind of buoyed our summer conditions. But even these kind of four years of okay summer, um, you know, by our Mediterranean standards, okay seasons, uh, being bounded by these extreme droughts on either side just means that we're right back in the thick of it. Um, you're, we're not able to kind of claw back those uh, environmental gains that that storage and aquifers keep that water on the landscape for long enough. Um, and yeah, as Sarah's pointing out, this is this is a mega drought, and this is just a little snapshot into that window. But once you kind of think about the three-year life cycle of the coho salmon that we're focused on, um, most of these year classes are going to be touched um, by drought in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so, as Brishka mentioned, it's really easy to lose like just a whole year class in some of these really poor conditions. And so that really, once you add all that up, really hampers uh, your recovery efforts. And yeah, so just the takeaways from 2021, um, it was all bad news, uh, limited and late adult spawning tributary access for the adults. Um, the early spring disconnection really hampered out migration of our smolts. Um, the juveniles that were um, reared uh, during that winter, half of them were located in areas that inevitably went dry by the end of the summer. Even where there was wetted habitat, it wasn't necessarily habitable for some monads. And so these were the driest in-stream conditions uh, since our monitoring began in 2012, at least in this kind of fashion we have. And what we're seeing is really a cumulative effect of multi-year droughts. And so with that, uh, thank all of our many partners and turn this back over to Sarah for some concluding comments and maybe questions. Thank you, Troy. That was really bleak, but a really great summary. Um, it definitely is pretty terrifying to think that according to climate forecasts, this could be more of our new normal. And um, yeah, just kind of reinforces this same message of the importance to step up the scale and pace and scope of this work. And um, it also just seems like a really good window to focus on preserving and enhancing flow refugia where we still have it. Like so those blue areas in that watershed scale map that you showed um, and also returning flow sufficient to reconnect pools, you know, really focusing on those intermittent reaches as well, because if it was intermittent this past year in this drought, um, there's a chance it's hovering right at the edge there. But yeah, really interesting. I think it's easy to associate uh, summer conditions, you know, dry drought and drying with summer conditions, but it's really frightening when it runs year round and impacts, you know, multiple cohorts of fish. Um, Jessica, do you, do we have any questions? We have a couple minutes before our break. Yeah, we have one question so far from Mary Olswang. Um, since there are no diversions or wells on Willow, how can we improve stream flow? I think uh, this is going to be a good segue into Brock's presentation, hopefully. Oh boy, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that one. It's, uh, yeah, a harbinger, if anything, I guess, just to let everyone know how bad it can be in even some of these areas where um, there's not a lot of active uh, diversion. I mean, there's still historical impacts from, um, yeah, human influence, but um, there's no active uh, draws on it. So it is, does paint a truly bleak picture there. Although, yeah, the, the drainage and the hydrologic function has still been impaired over many years of intensive land use in that system. And so there's forest management and landscape scale considerations there too. So um, I'm really actually, that is a great transition <laughs> into what Brock is gonna be speaking with us um, about after the break. So it looks like, yeah, Joe Petras says, um, there very well could be diversions in Willow Creek above anatomy. And it's also very in size for most of its upper reach. So speaking to that kind of this impacts of that historic land use and the loss of proper hydrologic function there. Um, all right, let's take a break and regroup here in 15 minutes at 2.15.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully you're all back with us now. So I don't know that Brock actually needs an introduction for anybody in our audience. For those of you that don't know Brock, if, if that's the case, he is the co-director of Occidental Arts and Ecology Center's Water Institute. Take it away, Brock. Great, thanks Sarah and everybody on the partnership and um, all very daunting following up so many amazing talks. So I'm going to share screen here. And people see that? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, let's just get going with this. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Russian River Coho Water Resource Partnership. We've mentioned the dominant watersheds that we've been working in and Porter was mentioned as being added on. And while there's a lot of talk, I think of the watersheds, I think appropriately so, we've really been focused on the, on the fluvial portion and, and predominantly the, the class one, the, the hopefully the perennial <laughs> portion of the waterway, which supports the fish, although we've been hearing, unfortunately, with all that gauging and fish data and um, such that some of those waterways that are supposed to be perennial are less so tragically increasingly. And so that's really the nexus of, as we've heard, the origin of the partnership around some of the work we've been doing on trying to figure out the water quantity side of the fishery piece. And I think these, the stream flow improvement plans that we've put out, the SIPs for some of the watersheds have obviously been super important. And over the, the now decade plus of working together as a partnership, uh, increasingly, we were having conversations about how much we were addressing the human need for water and the existing conditions and the state of the channels and trying to address the, the, the most obvious straws, if you will, the, the direct diversions or the, the frost protections by adding a frost fan in or augmenting supply with roof water harvesting or an off-stream storage or uh, other forms of, of trying to help both support humans need for water, but also um, maintain and augment support flows for fish. And I think we've done an amazing job and lots of innovation and creativity around those uh, a suite, a portfolio of practices, if you will, that are science-based solutions for fish and people. And yet what I think increasingly put all of us in the partnership we would be meeting kept coming up with the fact that while we're really focused on the stream corridors, the fluvial corridors, we really need to start thinking about the whole watershed and recognizing the relationship of, we've got dirty creeks in the winter and summer creeks that are dry. And it's this whole seasonality of the whole system. And the creeks are really the, the keystone indicators of the condition of the watershed from the ridge to the river. And the sense that the conditions within the watershed are ultimately a direct indictment, if you will, of all the, historic, modern settler colonial uh, historic uh, uses and current land uses, and ultimately dirty dry creeks with nearly extinct salmonids don't lie. And that's just kind of uh, brutal. And the idea that we started the partnership with 20 fish apparently coming back and now we're quitting at 600 fish. I don't know, we need more. <laughs> so, you know, but we love our fish. And so how is it that we support these coho spawning and making these beautiful little babies? This is one of the one of the babies that was first taken out of Dutch Bill Creek to kick off the Dutch Bill portion of the genetics for the um, broodstock program, actually. And getting those fish back from the ocean into maturity and ultimately letting them do their thing. And then the whole anadromous nutrient pump, which really connects us to the watershed, all of those nutrients that um, that these fish have accumulated out in their pelagic uh, processes that we turn back, hopefully they've made babies and now we get to feed the forest with this fish fertilizer, which is a fertilizer specifically, not just for dug firs, which is a nice fertilizer, but for every other tree out there as well for the forest. And so really we often, and I know I'm specifically often on a bender of really attempting to uh, honor watersheds as basins of relations and how do we rethink from that ridge to the river to the reef and what is a res both a reverential and a resilient rehydration a revolution and a retrofit and so moving out of the class ones and class twos what does it really look like I think modern settler uh, paradigms um, 
are very much focused on the drainage. We're really good at draining things. We, we've just killed off the beavers. We've ditched it. We've drained it. We've dehydrated it. We've desiccated it. And anything that's left, we'll suck it dry too. And that's just a, a, a national, uh, it's actually a, a, in the terrestrial space of this uh, water planet. We've been really good at, at the drainage. And we've got to switch to the retain age. How do we figure out how to retain that water? And I know a lot of work historically has been done on looking at road networks and the derangement of hydrologic condition in roads. And there's certainly been some support for roads in the past as in some of our watersheds. We at, at Oxnard Ecology Center participated in a fish friendly road program a number of years ago. Um, and I think that while Danny Hagens would say nothing in nature mimics a road, I think a lot of the road work has been seen as primarily focused on water quality parameters, sediment reduction, which is totally important. But what I think hasn't been understood well enough and needs more focus and actual funding is really thinking about roads as also water harvesting structures. So how can we both protect water quality while we utilize the road networks strategically depending on their opportunity to also be structures to harvest water, to slow and spread and sink water. And this is something that people all over many other places in the country and the planet are very much accustomed to doing. And I don't think we see our road networks that way. On the drainage side of things, I'm not solely throwing vineyards under the bus here, but in general, whether it's urban, suburban, rural development, but I think vineyards especially the, the, the installation of drain tiles, whatever is required for irrigation and frost protection, just the increasing uh, utilization of water, typically from shallow groundwater or adjacent alluvial waters or the creeks themselves on behalf of our, our agricultural world is, is a challenge. And yet, thankfully, there's a whole lot of solutions to address that. Um, and I, I would just ref reference people to these wonderful books by a very dear friend of mine, Brad Lancaster. That green covered book is 400 pages of ideas about how to modify the topography of landscapes to increase their capacity as to become water retaining, water harvesting landscapes. And often I'll, I've said for years, I'm not sure we live in a water scarce area, we just live in a storage scarce area. And while many people think storage is about above ground impoundments, ultimately it's really about the uh, geology and the soils and the relationship of that rainfall to discharge and human need and the delta between those um, increase, how can we respongify the uplands to increase their water holding capacity, which is what I think the pre-development hydrologic condition of most of our watersheds was very spongy and the post-development dehydration, desiccation or impervious surfaces, if you will, um, has amplified the runoff coefficient, exacerbated the rate of flow discharge off of landscapes, the exacerbation of incision in the landscapes, and, and obviously delivering increased sediment in the winter and leading to dry creeks in the summer. Um, and thank you, I know Matt O'Connor's on the call here, um, but uh, OEI with funding from Cowfish and Wildlife and Goldridge RCD is in collaboration with the partnership in us really striving to think like a watershed that, Put some effort into coming up with some of these um, integrated groundwater surface water studies for restoration planning here looking at Green Valley Creek um, and Dutchbill Creek and trying to understand the water balance and uplands and geology and soils and slope and where where can we slow and spread and sink water and where shouldn't we waste our money and how do we increasingly manage our uplands, the 90% of the surface area of any watershed that leads to that critical 10% of quote blue line stream. How do we increase the gaining aspect of these watersheds um, is a really key question. And so this phrase of mine from 20 plus years ago, of slow it, spread it, sink it, store it and share it. What does that really look like functionally at the urban, rural, sub urban, rural suburban, forestry, rangeland and agricultural nexus? For many years, uh, we've had our Conservation Hydrology Demonstration Center at OAC and have worked on lots of things from integrated stormwater retention, contour infiltration structures. We do compost toilets and gray water and root water harvesting and water conservation and drip systems and a full uh, portfolio of ideas. But I think as much as we gotta think and act like a watershed, I think increasingly the reality is we gotta start thinking like a fire shed too. And that got brought up earlier and I, and I appreciate Troy's acknowledgement in the maps they're looking at stream flow from the Wallbridge fire or from some of the fires over in the west 
in Mark West area about the observation that when you burn off the significant amount of the vegetation and the associated evapotranspiration relationship of that water to the veg, that stream flow responds. And this is something I've been really interested in for decades. And so both my forest management hat on, water hat on, wildlife and fire um, have really been interested in these uh, overstocked forest stands in our post clear cut fire suppression landscapes. What does it look like to have fewer trees and more forest? And then the question is, does that result in actual more flow? And if anyone doesn't know this wonderful book um, here, um, Harold Biswell's Prescribed Burning in California Wildlands uh, came out in 99 or so, and I got a hold of it pretty early. And this image here from the 40s of a dry, rocky stream bed, and then they did a prescribed fire, and not that long afterwards, look, you know, it's completely big, full pools of water. And that was something that got me inspired to really think about this. And so we at OAC have inherited a landscape that's overstocked primarily with fir and broom. And so we've been fully engaged in the fewer trees, more forest. And so here's a crew of Marine Conservation Corps youth in the early 2000s, limbing and thinning out Douglas fir, and then reutilizing that material, in this case, in an incised a gully area that's been dehydrating and delivering sediment off this landscape for decades. So I'm interested in how do we have regenerative disturbance regimes that interface with the fire cycle on behalf of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and thus the life cycle. And I totally appreciate, and again, give uh, props to Matt and Jeremy here in this initial study and inquiry around understanding a uh, stage, uh, stand age and forest evapotranspiration relationships and, and implications for salmonic recovery. Super interested in it. Um, and so our game here again is in thinking holistically and looking to see the forest for the trees and the flow, which I think is what Willow, the question about Willow Creek is really important, um, is really then saying that ultimately for us, slashing is, is not trash, it's beneficial biomass. And as we limb and thin fir and release oak woodlands, we're gonna, we strive to basically mitigate these incisions and these head cuts and these upland class three systems. And so we're really seeing all of that incredible organic matter in the landscape that's perceived of as being highly flammable as a incredible resource that photosynthesis has offered us up in, in the carbon cycle. And so how do we engage with um, that material for wildlife habitat, for uh, lopping and scattering, for putting on contour, for stuffing gullies, for chipping, for possibly biochar burning, for soil health. And so this past year with friends at the regional North Coast Water Control Board and at Cal Fish and Wildlife, um, we have uh, pulled a couple permits here to actually formally commence uh, stuffing gullies with this forest fuel load biomass and beginning to work on that process in a more explicit manner. And so we've been working on this for a long time, but we're now doing it. And here's my thesis that beneficial biomass is being stuffed into these gullies, these upland class three head cuts to mitigate their migration of the head cut while we reduce the channel incision to buffer the flashy flows that decrease the sediment delivery to the coho and steelhead bearing uh, Dutchville Creek downstream while we mitigate fuel load and sequester carbon as a compost to enhance forest resilience with amplified upland water holding capacity, shallow groundwater recharge, and hopefully improved latent flow releases. What do you think, people? That's my treatise for you on that one, right? And so all of that really requires, I think, that it's not just ecosystem restoration, but ecosystem restoration. How do we restore the ecosystem? and honor that we are part of the relations within our shared basins. And that coho is an indicator of how well us two-legged naked apes actually get our act together to figure this out from ridge to down to the river. And so in the headwaters, I wanna honor the, this beautiful head of the coho. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you all. Thank you, Brock. That was really interesting, really compelling. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Lots to think about there. I don't want to get into a, a negative slant here, but I, I just have to ask, how long did it take you to get the permits to stuff the gullies, to do that simple project with all the benefits that you just expounded on? 
Uh, well, um, you know, uh, Jonathan Warmer Dam and Gil Falcone at the regional board there were um, <clears throat> initially had spoken with them quite a bit. And so uh, when we actually decided to say, yes, we're going to do this, and we submitted the initial paperwork to when we got both of those permits, was probably six months or so in a field visit. Um, um, and then, you know, James Hansen, I also want to give props to James Hansen with CDFW because he was on the, on the um, uh, lake and stream bed alteration permit. And so I, they all, you know, I think everyone came together really well and we're a, a known site, to be honest with you, a known location and a number of those folks have been on site and have seen various work. And so I think we were able to push it forward faster, but it is interesting to note that um, it, 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 by the letter of the law slash is currently considered a hazardous material, which I totally understand when we look at industrial forest timberland management and the inappropriate utilization and, and installation of that material. But what I'm really talking about is very explicit, strategic focused. It's an installation of a, of a project, just like you would put an in-stream structure, a vortex weir, a boulder cluster, a root wad. Um, there's a process, there's a prescription, it's a methodological and rigorous um, uh, effort. So we're hopeful, yeah, I, I invite any and all of you to come on out for a tour. You can, we'll go on gully stuff and tour. We love doing that. <laughs> we have uh, one question from Matt O'Connor. Great Coast Range Watershed Restoration Paradigm. Any provisions for hydrologic monitoring to document efficacy? Well, you know, Matt, I, I'm, your, your, your open invitation is still waiting for you to come out there and figure out how to instrument these things. You know, I mean, if we need another beard, another SRF to, to figure out the, the protocol, then bring it on. I see those thumbs up. No, seriously, I, I, we would love any of you all in, on, in the group here to come and, and see the site as a place to, um, to, to have a look at, to study, to do some uh, project documentation of possible benefits and things. Cause we're, we're getting after it right now. We're, I actually have a crew of 10 people right now working for a month doing limbing and thinning on 41 acres. And we're, we've been going for it. So come on out, love to study it. I don't have the capacity or time to do it. Uh, James Hansen, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question or comment? Oh, yeah, thanks, Jessica. You know, I just wanted to bring up that, um, you know, I think it's it's really cool that that Brock and his team at OAEC are taking this kind of stuff on because, you know, I'll say that um, just as sort of an anecdote, when we're reviewing, you know, maybe a culvert replacement or a stream restoration project or a new bridge or something like that, you know, a lot of the time is spent on reviewing design plans and engineering plans and going over the hydrology and things like that. And, and for this, uh, it was a lot of fun because a lot of our time was spent like sharing this with colleagues and going, hey, have you heard of this gully stuffing? Like, have you seen this, you know, in practice? And a lot of it was just like sharing it around and be like, hey, what do you think of this? And kind of just getting opening people's minds to sort of some of this beneficial reuse of, of both slash and then also some of these, you know, low impact restoration techniques that are you know, um, more accessible, I would say, to to a rural landowner, a private landowner than than some, you know, giant, um, you know, quarter million dollar restoration project or something. So just a shout out there. And, and um, you know, uh, I, I think a, a positive vibe going forward in terms of permitting this kind of project. You know, I think this is the first time any of us in, in region at least had seen the gully stuffing idea and this beneficial reuse of sort of what could be considered a a negative aspect of some of these other ma land management projects, you know, having all this slash. And uh, I think going forward, it's going to be just something that we're more from the agencies are more familiar with. And therefore it'll just be one of those like, Oh yeah, this is one of those great low impact projects. That's really beneficial. Let's move this thing forward really quick. So I, I have a, I have positive sort of feelings about the ability to permit these things going forward and, and making them um, streamlined. So just want to throw that out there because I think it's nice to have some, some positive information. And, and I thought that, this was a really cool, um, really cool project that got us all thinking about this. And, and I think it will be a lot easier to, to permit in the future and, and hopefully quicker. Okay. I um, just see Lisa, Lisa McKaylee's got a question there I was tracking about, is there a limiting gully size depth and shear stress that can be treated in this way? And I, I would just say that um, the 
the, there's large woody debris that's helicopter placed down in big systems. And then in Dutch Bill Creek, there's woody debris that's got, uh, you know, cables on it and bolts. And then as we move up the system into the class twos up to the class threes, my sense is, is that the proportionate relationship of the size of the wood from large woody debris up to meso woody debris into micro woody debris into, right? It's just like a tree, you proportionate the proportionally utilize the material in commensurate with the shear stress and the, and the stream power equation. And I think we have a portfolio of tools and strategies that can take us from the tippy top of the headwaters all the way down to the biggest streams in a process-based uh, restoration paradigm, a, a low-tech process-based restoration paradigm. We at OAC and the work we're doing is all up in class three systems, order one systems, um, no, it's non-fish bearing, it's non even aquatic invertebrate systems. And so we're, we're utilizing material that's limbs, needles, branches, and, and then we have bigger logs uh, up to eight inches because our permit with the North Bay Forest Improvement Program funding that we have limits our ability to cut trees under eight inches DBH. So we're adding larger logs up to that size, not really for shear strength, but actually just because I want longer term, more durable carbon rotting and composting in those channels to hold water for the tree roots to get a hold of as a carbon sequestration um, subsurface irrigation opportunity. Yeah, that's awesome. It really gets back at that restoring ecosystem function, right? Process based. Well, thank you. Really interesting conversation. And we're going to move on now and hear about some of the key lessons learned by the partnership. I know that was quite a whittling down exercise. And Jessica Pollitz, who's an engineer with the Sonoma RCD, and Marianne King, who is TU's California Water Project Director, I believe are kind of tag teaming this one. Yep. Can you all see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Yeah, as Sarah introduced, I'm Jessica with Sonoma RCD and myself and Marianne with Trout Limited will be talking about some of the bigger picture takeaways. I think everyone's presentation has kind of gleaned um, some lessons learned and some thoughts about what, what we can do to change or improve things in the future. And uh, Marianne and I are gonna cover some of those things. So I'll be talking about lessons learned. <laughs> 12 plus years of work in the Coho Partnership, we've, we've definitely learned a ton of things from when we first started up until now. In some ways, it feels like we're just hitting our stride and it's a bummer that our programmatic funding is ending, but in other ways, this is a really neat opportunity to reflect back on what all we've done and what all we've learned. So one of the first things that, we wanted to acknowledge and that obviously as half of our members are scientists, hydrologists, biologists, is that you can't do flow restoration work without a scientific basis. We need to include these types of organizations in partnership to do the monitoring, to do the on the ground work, to do the data analysis that support the implementation projects. <clears throat> Otherwise we wouldn't know where to put a tank or where these diversion signatures that Mia is seeing are occurring. So really having monitoring data, scientific knowledge and background is a key part of the work that we do. Also, uh, they're critical to put together future metrics. So looking at where we are now, what's been affected by the drought, the fires, what's happening in the future. So really they've They've created this uh, scientific knowledge basis for these critical watersheds in, in the Russian River, and we've been able to operate and work together to make the most sound scientific-based decisions in some of the implementation work that we've been able to accomplish within the partnership. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about is, it has been mentioned quite a bit, just the flexible funding nature of the partnership, the programmatic funding, I feel like that is one of the most critical aspects of the partnership. And again, very uh, challenging that we're losing that. <clears throat> it's really allowed us to adjust priorities and be flexible with where we need to spend our time and money, 
in the beginning, very monitoring heavy, very data modeling, gathering towards the middle and latter parts of the partnership, a lot more money is going towards implementation because we know where the project work needs to happen and we're pushing for more on the ground stuff. Um, also what's been critical is the ability that this funding has allowed us to create a pipeline of projects. Sometimes landowner relationships take years and years and years to get off the ground, um, five years, 10 years, and having a program that we know is gonna last 10, and in this case, 12 years, was really helpful to realize that the effort that we were putting forward, um, we will have money in a year and two years and three years to keep working with this person who maybe we're just starting to get to know, or maybe they uh, are just starting to develop their land and think about how they can uh, be watershed stewards. So really this type of funding didn't follow the traditional grant cycle where you need to have a 65% design, there's a one to two month solicitation window, and then you have to complete the project within one to three years. It was so incredible that uh, we could be building projects on top of projects and relationships as this 12 years of funding went through. The second piece about flexible funding is just how nimble it allowed us to be, especially when we're responding to natural disasters and emergencies like the drought and like wildfires. Um, it was so helpful that we had this program in place because we could respond immediately to certain drought conditions. That's how a lot of our flow release projects got started is that there was a drought and we had willing landowners who were wanting to help us out. And we could immediately be on the ground in meetings with teams of scientists, biologists, hydrologists, engineers, the permitting agencies and figure out how can we address these immediate crisis needs as opposed to saying, well, we know there's a grant funding coming down the line in next, you know, December, and we'll apply for a permit then or a, a grant application then. It was like we were ready to go and implement, and that was totally the magic of having this type of flexible funding. Uh, finally, I'll just tack on that uh, another part of it is that we can participate in these region-wide information sharing. So we're sharing our data, we're presenting at uh, meetings a lot of times hosted by a lot of your agencies that are on this call. Uh, we can engage in the dialogue about how we're doing this restoration work as a collective. And so without that funding, we're not necessarily going to be able to be as present and as participatory as we'd like to, because now we're kind of in this more piecemeal project by project funding cycle coming out of this. Uh, the next critical piece that is really relevant to the work in the lower Russian River tributaries is stream flow. When we first got started, we were asking ourselves two questions. The first question was, is all of this energy, time, money, resources really worth it if we can't fix every single straw in the watershed that has been alluded to, every single diversion? And the second question was, if we're only able to address a few straws, and maybe only restore a tiny bit of stream flow into the watershed, would that make a difference? So the partnership and its agencies, its organizations embarked on a seven year study that looked at correlating flow and other environmental variables with juvenile coho survival rate. The main outcome of this long study is that we learned and our uh, Organizations learn that there's an extremely negative relationship between fish survival and pool connectivity that Mia and Sarah have talked about. Therefore, if we can lower the days, the number of days that pools are disconnected, we have a great shot at increasing fish survival. The results of this study led us to do another investigation which looked at um, stream flow rates. And we found that literally increasing stream flow by hundredths or tenths of a CFS is enough to sustain pool connection and limit salmon mortalities in these specific lower Russian, Russian river tributaries. So we can answer our questions that we started with in the beginning of the partnership of, is this worth it? <laughs> yes, it is. And is just addressing a tiny bit of stream flow, addressing a few critical straws and critical locations, will that make a difference? And we can answer and say, yes, it can make a difference. 
So uh, California Sea Grant actually published the results of these studies in 2018, and the findings from this study has been utilized by so many different agencies and organizations and people across the region and across the state since that was published. Finally, I'll end with talking about metrics. Um, as scientists and as practitioners and as funders who are all on this call, we all know the value of metrics. Um, it's important to gauge how well we're doing. Femka talked about what some of the metrics were that were established in the beginning of the partnership. Um, initially, we, we talked about, okay, how are we gonna measure this? We thought about adult returns and real, we realized that's tricky to track because there's so many different factors about adult returns especially the things that Troy highlighted with climate related um, issues and what's happening at the mouth of the river and the ocean, um, and also how much how many releases were taking place. We thought about in the beginning and we did look into uh, monitoring juvenile salmon survival in relation to projects, so looking at before and after a project. We found that was very expensive and difficult to do. Um, Eventually we moved to modeling. So we modeled the probability of survival and how it relates to uh, days of stream flow disconnection and survival. And we based those models on seven years of data. And eventually, as I talked about earlier, we identified that we identified the amount of stream flow that was needed to maintain pool connection. And we used those volumes and amounts as target thresholds for our uh, restoration work and our project work. Um, the challenge, as many of you all know, is that in coastal California, stream flow is so low, and Mia, uh, Mia, both Mia and Troy talked about this, that um, often a lot of times our streams go dry. And we're talking about very small increments of CFS in you know, the spring and, and into the summer. And so it's hard to gauge a small project that's, say, replacing a near stream well a 0.02 CFS, it's hard to find that signature on our gauges. Uh, addition, in addition to that, it's hard to compare one year to the next. Let's say a project was built right before the drought and then the drought happened. It's hard to monitor the effects of a project when there's other conditions such as climate, wildfires, how the rainfall is distributed, which was talked about earlier as well. So it's very, very tricky <laughs> to come up with accurate metrics that really feel like we're demonstrating what type of uh, improvements we're able to make. Ultimately, what the partnership has settled on and what we've been doing in our reporting and our analysis is um, estimating the potential benefits. So we, we have a pretty solid understanding of what the diversion rate was before and what we're offsetting or definitely for a slow release project because we're really able to monitor that, how much water is going into the creek. And then we're able to quantify based on all of these projects, especially uh, lumping projects together in targeted reaches, we're able to estimate the benefit of uh, each of our projects and our projects collectively. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Mary Ann to talk about the future of this work. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> so, um, this sort of dovetails with the lessons learned and a lot of what everybody else talked about. Um, but we wanted to, to talk a little bit about some of the conditions that we see supporting work that has supported our work, but also will support our work in the future. Um, and again, like there's a report that we're writing that has probably 15 bullets. Um, but for the purpose of today, we, we whittled it down to three. So. The first is the hot topic, everybody's favorite topic, permitting. And I thought I would start here by reminding ourselves of where we started. So it was like 2017, 2007, 2008, 2009, beginning of the partnership. And the questions that we were asking of ourselves and that those of you who helped us begin the partnership were also asking were things like, would a landowner ever allow us to put a gauge on their property. Now reference Mia's presentation. Would anyone ever talk to you about their water rights? I mean, that was an open question. Um, and we, and I think our response was our hypothesis is yes. <laughs> um, and then 
okay, fine, they'll talk to you, but will anything ever get permitted? Like, can you actually obtain a water right to do this stuff? Could you make changes to water rights? And again, like we hadn't, we hadn't done it, right? We had examples up in the Matul River of Sanctuary Forest working on this, the Scott River Water Trust working on this. We could point to a few limited like demonstration projects where folks had done it before. And again, our answer was like, we have a hypothesis that folks will be interested and that the permitting is possible. But that's that was like the baseline of where we started. So as we're talking about permitting, I just wanted to kind of take us back and remind remind us of where we began. Those That's where we began. Um, and so as, as we've done projects, um, we have succeeded in getting projects permitted. We have also had projects that have not made it through the permitting process. And I think our perspective as a partnership has always been that all of these things had, you know, we're, we're aiming for like tangible benefit in a creek and for fish, but the sort of ancillary piece was always like, this is a learning experience for us about how to do the work and it's not like tanks and ponds. A lot of these approaches aren't new things, right? Like folks have been using tanks and ponds for many years for other purposes, but trying to, to, to basically use them and wield them for the, for the purpose of um, fisheries conservation and stream flow enhancement was, was kind of the new piece that we're biting off. So um, it was, I think we always had a perspective of what can we learn from the permitting process? What do we learn about how our processes work um, essentially by doing these these projects in addition to, to the other pieces. So um, with that prelude, um, some things we learned. Um, so I think one of the challenges that like we often talk about with permitting processes is that it just, you know, they're, they're set up to regulate, they're set up to find the bad, they're not necessarily set up to like help us achieve the good, right? And that, you know, that's probably just a, like maybe a fundamental element of that. Um, but one of the, some of the things that we have found that have worked well and that I think um, will inform our future work and the work of other folks across the coast who are doing this. Um, one of those primary things is really that we've succeeded and we've done the best when we've been able to work as a team with our agency partners. Um, from the beginning, right? So anticipating what some of the permitting constraints are going to be, allowing those to enter into project development, being upfront with landowners about um, what the restrictions are and just being really honest about it. Um, learning from folks who have a really good understanding of what those permitting processes are and then being able to work with folks and think creatively about how to navigate within. And I think as we move forward, as as this expands and also as projects get more complex, um, I think that's gonna be really important, the creativity piece and the ability to recognize that like, we're going to struggle with some of this stuff and we need help. And the more that I think um, we can really visualize this as a partnership of um, agencies and practitioners and, and groups, that is a, a true partnership, not necessarily like a, you know, we're a subcontractor um, coming to you with our project, but really like how do we begin to work together from the beginning to advance the work? So that's the first thing. Um, the second, which is related is that I think for a lot of us, the last drought was a real turning point. Um, and it, there was a lot of motivation and, and a lot of things occurred and we, react, we were all reacting and scrambling. And a lot of you on the phone call were right there with us. Um, and one of the things that I think we observed about, you know, permitting in particular was that there were moments when um, it felt like agencies really had the ability to exercise discretion in a way that the door hadn't been open in that, in, in that way before. And I think that enabled us to do a lot that we felt like hadn't, we hadn't been able to do before. It's where a lot of the really kind of creative solutions came from. Um, a lot of the kind of ad hoc um, projects that were developed, you know, had a basis in something that, you know, we had, we had thought about, there was sort of a kernel there that can't make a release, right? We had, we had brainstormed about that and thought it, it completely like infeasible from a permitting perspective. But um, the ability to just think differently about discretion and how to navigate within those processes, I think really opened up a lot. Um, and so I would encourage us going forward to really think about the, 
what's the role of leadership within our agencies to allow for, for that? And also, um, you know, how do we enable it? And, you know, not in a way we're like cutting corners, like permitting processes are really important, but if we've got a fork in the road, you know, do you always have to send the, the restoration project down the, hard, the hardest path possible? You know, just even asking some, I think some basic questions like that. Um, and then I'm gonna also make a plug for permitting. I think we have a tendency to think about like, if it's long-term, it's good. And if it's short-term, it's bad. And I think a lot of what we're realizing from a permitting perspective is that we often, especially in the stream flow realm, need a way to test things especially things like, like flow releases have really illustrated this. Um, you don't necessarily wanna invest in the, in the hyper long-term project in the first year, right? You want the ability to test it out and you may have to have the ability to test it out and you wanna know if it works um, as the entity's promoting it, the landowner wants to know if it works for them, agencies wanna know if it, if, if it works, right? And so we have to almost have this ability, like iterative process of like, be able to experiment, learn, um, come back, tinker. Um, and we've done that with a lot of the flow releases, but I think as we move forward thinking about are there ways, and a lot of you have been thinking with us about this too, I wanna acknowledge that, but are there ways within our permitting processes to allow for shorter term things that let us, let us learn, adapt, and then you know maybe it does lead to a long-term project or maybe it doesn't. But um, I think that's kind of a piece of the permitting world that often um, we're realizing is really important and often isn't, isn't like as possible or isn't as addressed. Um, okay, last thought on permitting. And this isn't like I have an answer here. This is just kind of, I'm gonna throw it out. Um, but I was really struck, y'all have sat in meetings with Margie Kaisley and like one of her big concepts is like, hey, like don't pre-constrain yourself, you know? <laughs> and I think as we're thinking about, this, this that's, a, that's a life example too, but the, in, in terms of streamflow enhancement and restoration projects, um, I think we have a tendency and it's a logical tendency to, to do that, right? Because uncertainty, especially as practitioners means cost, it means potential rep you know, ruptured relationships with landowners. It means, you know, you fail on a project and you jeopardize your ability to, you know, do a project in the future. Grant, get, there's, there's risk associated with that. And so there's logical reasons to pre-constrain yourself. But I think as a restoration community, I think if there's ways that from an agency perspective and a practitioner's perspective, like how do we figure out how not to pre-constrain ourselves and to think bigger than maybe we have been? So I don't have an answer there, but I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave permitting with that. Okay, um, moving on to the sticks and the carrots. So um, we've, we have a non-regulatory approach that we have employed as the partnership. And I think over time, what we've realized is that there's always a relationship between the carrots that we wield and whatever the stick is doing. And it manifests in different ways. Um, so one of those ways that it, it can manifest is when we work with landowners and um, they see that they are uh, having to navigate a permitting process and there's a lot of scrutiny upon them for doing something good, but their neighbor isn't treated the same way. Um, and so there's, a, there's, there's a definitely a sort of no good deed, deed unpunished piece of this that, that plays into whether folks wanna work with us on collaborative proje projects. So I would encourage us um, as a community to think really carefully about um, how those two things work together and how the incentives and disincentives for action work together. The other thing that I think comes into play with car the carrot and the stick is really thinking about that there is a utility um, for in targeted enforcement and also regulation. And some of it comes down to protecting and making sure that the work that we have done and the investment that we have done um, is, is maintained over time. Um, and then third thing um, with regard to this relationship between the carrot and the stick is um, it, it manifested also as agencies took an interest in the frost protection regulation and also the emergency regulations around the drought is the incentives and disincentives for landowners and water users changed. And so we saw a lot of interest in 
projects and doing good work, both because folks were motivated, but also because um, because there was a, a little bit of a showing of a, of a stick. And so I think in that case, the partnership really played a large role in being the technical support and helping to come in and enable those projects to occur that maybe had been motivated by, by that piece. So I would encourage us to think really carefully moving forward about how those two things interact and how they play together. And for those of us that you know, do have sticks as tools, um, you know, think really carefully about how we can employ those because um, I do think they're an important part of streamflow restoration. All right. Uh, last thing is drought and climate change. This was covered by a lot of folks in most of the slides leading up to this. And I, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, again, going back to the last drought, I think there was a lot of the partnership and, and all of our agency partners, there was a lot of activity um, and a lot of motivation to do a lot of really good things. And we did a lot of really good things. Um, and I think we've also noticed that you know, as the drought ends, even as Mia alluded to, um, it may not have ended on the coast and it may not have ended in our, in our Russian river tribs, but you know, it, it legally ended. And when that happens, right, all of those structures that we sort of have created together sort of break down and we lose, we lose the, the outreach phone tree and we lose like the stuff that we had built up we tried to keep some things going and move them from being, you know, really ad hoc into long term, but it becomes more difficult as sort of drought ends and then drought begins again and it feels like we're building it back up. And so one of our lessons learned um, that I think contributes to work in the future is really how can we maintain an aspect of um, the planning that has gone into drought really leading into the next drought because it's, you know, we're getting a glimpse of what our future is going to be. And so how do we keep, um, how do we keep the communication going? How do we, as Mita, Mia alluded to, um, start to use what we've learned from our data about predicting um, what's going to happen in a year, what the thresholds and triggers are for action, and then also planning around what those actions can be and what things could go into effect and have that uh, in advance instead of sort of feeling like we're behind the curve. So that's my bit. Um, and that's all I've got. So if we want to, I'll turn it back to Sarah for facilitation and questions. Thank you. That was great. I really appreciate your thoughtful synthesis, Jessica and Marianne. I think just to stay on track with time, what we'll do now, we'll just take a five minute break. We don't have any questions in the queue. Some may come up later. We'll see if we have time for them, but let's meet back here at 3.07. Okay, welcome back everybody. If everybody who is on the panel could please turn on their cameras at this portion. And actually we just invite anybody who would like to turn on their cameras. Um, Mary Ann is gonna facilitate a panel of our uh, agency partners that have uh, agreed kindly to, to share their opinions with us as our guests. And um, I think after each one of them has time to speak, we're gonna see if we have time to open it up for questions. So you can add your questions in the chat along the way. And then if time allows for it, it would be nice to just have a little bit more of a kind of um, informal format if people do wanna ask questions on camera. So um, Marianne, if you wanna go ahead and introduce our panel. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, all right, so just a little bit of background. We, we've spent, I think, every TAC meeting trying to have a discussion, but mostly talking at folks and, all, and wanted to make sure that, especially with this meeting after multiple hours of us presenting, that we really had an opportunity to open it up and hear from our agency partners uh, and hear their visions and their articulation of constraints and opportunities. So that was sort of the impetus and the motivation for this, this panel. 
And so what we did is we sent out three questions and I'm gonna try to advance my slide. There we go. So questions are, what do you think are the biggest challenges to completing flow restoration work at the pace and scale needed to support local amount of recovery? What are your ideas for how we make this work more effective? What steps could your agency take to alleviate hurdles and challenges associated with, with the work? And then what is your agency's vision for the next five years? And uh, so we reached out to um, a lot of our agency partners and this is our illustrious um, panel. So we wanna thank you all for participating. Um, we've got Brian McFadden from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board, Rebecca Frist from the Wildlife Conservation Board, Derek Akum from CDFW, Joe Petrich from the Restoration Center, Rick Rogers from NIMPS, and Dan Schultz from the State Water Resources Control Board. So thank you all for being willing to participate. Um, and I'm just gonna, everybody's gonna get about five minutes. And so I'm gonna kick it over to Brian to begin. Um, and Brian, are you ready to, to kick us off? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So are we gonna just go through all three questions uh, serially or are we gonna go one question at a time? All three. Okay, um, well, I'll do my best. Cut me off when I've had enough time. <laughs> so the first question about um, <clears throat> the biggest challenges um, and and whether or not I think the challenges are surmountable. Uh, I, I think they are surmountable, but maybe <clears throat> not everywhere at once. Um, but in terms of the challenges, I think, you know, from a regulatory point of view, I think the biggest challenge is timely development of in-stream flow criteria. Um, we need the science so that we can inform thresholds for implementation of the water rights priority system. Um, uh, Dan Schultz and his colleagues have been very consistent about their messaging that, you know, what they need in terms of uh, criteria and thresholds to implement their regulatory program. And uh, those criteria just haven't come about. And so, um, one thing I would say about that is we need to be open-minded on alternative approaches to quantifying in-stream needs and make sure that we're not uh, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I think there's opportunity for moving faster through better agency collaboration. It's gotten a lot better since I've been working on this, but I think there's still room uh, for improvement there and for us to get out of our silos. Um, I think incentivizing local cooperative solutions to have the regulatory pro, you know, side of things uh, sort of move people over to um, the RCDs and, and the COHO partnership uh, players is something that we can continue to investigate and find a way to enhance. Um, in terms of the restoration elements, I think it's, it's about storage and we need more distributed storage. Um, the stuff that, you know, Goldridge RCD has been working on for a long time uh, and Sonoma RCD as well. Um, uh, it, those things work um, and we need a lot more of them. I think there's a scale issue too in that uh, it may not be possible to restore all the streams we want to in the time that's meaningful. And so it may mean that we have to make hard choices. Uh, and then of course, funding is always a challenge, uh, particularly for the RCDs and, and NGOs. And um, I would suggest that, you know, the hot button issues of today, like force management and carbon sequestration present opportunities for new funding sources. Uh, in my free time, I'm involved with the Eel River Recovery Project. And that organization has done a really good job of pivoting towards forest management and end up talking about all a lot of the same things uh, in terms of watershed restoration that um, that were the discussion prior to it being about forest management. So uh, I think those things really go well together. I haven't figured out how to fit COVID into watershed restoration, but maybe if there's a way to do that, there's another funding source. Um, I think another challenge is just attitudes, uh, public attitudes about water, drought, and climate. 
Um, I think a lot of people think this is something we're going through and that we'll eventually get through it. Uh, but uh, the changes to our climate are here to stay. Um, in terms of ideas about making the work more effective, um, increasing water supply through use of uh, advanced wastewater treatment and water recycling. I think that's an opportunity, you know, in terms of growing the water supply or, or uh, in the words of George W. Bush, making the pie higher. Uh, and so, uh, you know, at the regional board, we can't force municipalities to invest in that kind of treatment uh, that's needed. There's also a Title 22 engineering analysis that's required and uh, some approvals from our agency in the Division of Drinking Water. But um, where we can incentivize that and uh, help those struggling municipalities like Creighton, uh, for instance, uh, Occidental, um, that, uh, that represents a real untapped resource. A lot of difficult, difficult issues there, but um, not insurmountable. Um, <clears throat> I think also as agencies, you know, using uh, or exercising permitting and enforcement discretion um, is something that we can do. I think, you know, our agency is proud of the fact that we haven't always required a permit. And um, that may sound counterintuitive, but in these uh, crazy times, these all hands on deck sort of moments, um, maybe the best thing we can do is step out of the way. Um, and it still requires that we do our due diligence. We need to know that a pond isn't littering a stream with you know, cyanobacteria or creating some other issue. And so uh, in order for our agency to feel comfortable in that situation, it requires collaboration and coordination and what Marianne was just alluding to. But that, I, I think there's more room for that among other agencies and among our agency. Uh, I think groundwater recharge is an area that we can make progress um, where it makes sense. It doesn't always make sense. And, um, uh, you know, in the headwaters of Green Valley Creek, maybe there's not as many opportunities, but in places like Alexander Valley, certainly I think there are opportunities to um, reduce irrigation advance. One of, one of the things it does is create it elevates soil moisture so that less irrigation is needed and uh and in the process you know you can extend the connectivity of those uh, stream reaches for juveniles to uh, leave the systems and get out to the ocean um everything brock said uh I, i'm a wholehearted supporter of all those concepts um and we have some opportunities here post fire to uh manage vegetation uh, so that we're managing the regrowth. And I love uh, Brock's uh, statement, fewer trees, more forests. That's great. Uh, add to that more water. Um, in terms of what our agency is doing, um, can do, uh, we're, we're currently undergoing an internal review of how we can address water conservation and use in each of our programs. Um, and part of that is smarter permitting and incentivizing water conservation through tiered permit structures, uh, which we successfully implemented in our regional cannabis order since been um, superseded by the state order. But uh, those kinds of approaches where we give uh, permittees a break on, fund, uh, on fees, if they implement beneficial practices, there's room to move there. Um, also including mandatory water conservation requirements, um, but then also uh, for restoration projects, streamlining our permit process, reducing fees. You know, we were, I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to reduce uh, one of the fees that we use for these flow augmentation projects from $2,800 to $250. Uh, and we need to look for more of those opportunities. But when we develop permit programs for restoration activities, uh, there are some benefits. It's, it's not just a hurdle. You know, we can do the programmatic CEQA analysis to, to help uh, streamline the process down the road and, um, you know, have the public conversation um, and also 
predefined monitoring requirements. Um, and then once you get that permit from us, that's your protection from third party lawsuits uh, under the Clean Water Act, which you know tends to be pretty important for some people. Uh, uh, I think we can also develop some new policies and um, you know, near stream wells and repairing diversions are, are things that we want to investigate at the regional board of how we can use our basin planning authority to address those things to kind of address the demand side. I mean, yeah, the demand side of the, the water budget. Um, and uh, we're going to, we're in the process of establishing a narrative water quality objective for flow. Uh, and we also want to pursue numeric flow objectives. And to that end, um, we, we've been working on a contract with UC Berkeley for, uh, for analysis of dissolved oxygen relationships with flow conditions that is on the cusp of being executed. It's been taking forever, but um, that gives us a, an ability, hopefully, to establish numeric uh, objectives for flow. That's awesome, Brian. I don't want to stop you, but I have to cut you off. <laughs> well, I, I think the next question was really going to uh, look back onto this last answer. One thing I would do want to say is coordinated monitoring. And, you know, there was some of that uh, discussion about R3 and P in the, in the chat earlier. So just want to shout out to that. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things we can do. So that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was excellent. Um, all right. I'm going to pass the mic over to Rebecca Frist with the Wildlife Conservation Board. Marianne, I was going to ask if you could toggle back to the question slide just so that oh. uh, we can have it in our heads. And Katie also posted it in the chat, but could be yes. Nice. Yeah, I can do that. Great. Well, um, great to hear all the happenings in the Russian River. And I think you guys do know about the Wildlife Conservation Board since we funded over 15 projects in the watershed alone. But my name is Rebecca Friss. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at the Wildlife Conservation Board. And I've, um, I had the Streamflow program staff actually help in answering these questions for us. So, you know, we have been implementing a Streamflow program since 2015 with the passage of Prop 1 in 2014 that provided us $200 million for Streamflow enhancement. And we've got our own lessons learned. So just also to highlight to folks that we are in the process of developing a five-year review that really is getting into kind of what we've seen in our program over the last five years. And of course it is a statewide program. So we also are doing meadow restoration, forest health work um, and other, other types of activities beyond just helping someone it's in the North Coast. But um, when looking at these questions and I calculated, I have just a minute and a half or so for each, just a, some of the highlights is that, you know, for us implementing our program just the complexity of stream flow projects and the water rights aspect and actually purchasing water has proven super challenging, which I think you guys probably already know, but that's really been an issue for us of just how to actually get these projects developed and developed in the time frame of our bond funding, which you also know is can be constraining at times where we need to get something going within a few years and then you only have a couple of years beyond that to actually complete the work. So that's been a challenge for us. Um, just the fact that we were doing a competitive process that was kind of an annual process that we were stuck in a pretty um, strict time frames is also a challenge. Um, you know, just having one time a year to really be out there to talk about talk to, pro to folks about projects and then get the applications in and get the review done and they're not approved for a year later. I think you're probably all aware of that as well. Um, and then you know, just the heightened sensitivities around these types of projects that are, are affecting water rights. It's just, it's a tough field. And so we've definitely had that kind of slow down our ability to get the work done and really get stream or get water back into the streams. Um, so that's been an issue for us. So, you know, we're really working on now how to effectively move this work forward. Um, I think you all are probably aware that in this current budget cycle, we got some general fund money specific to stream flow again, and it's not going to be constrained within the Prop 1 uh, program guidelines. So we have some increased flexibility, and we're currently developing guidelines for that stream flow money. And um, in the next month or so, actually going to our February board meeting, we will have a, those draft guidelines in front of the board for approval. Uh, with the thought that then beyond that February board meeting, we'll be putting out a process for actually 
trying to solicit projects under the uh, new streamflow money that we have. So, you know, for us, it is about how do we um, get that money out on the ground as quickly as possible and effic as efficiently as possible. So that's going to mean uh, potentially moving to a more continuous process in the sense that we are hoping and working on kind of a uh, one pre-application that we'll have on our website that will be open on a continuous basis that would allow folks to put in a, a pre-application and then allow us to actually work with applicants to develop a full proposal for those that we feel are um, you know, best suited to the, the priorities that we put out for, that, for the different funding sources that we have. So that I think will actually make things uh, work a lot more efficiently moving forward. And then we need to continue our outreach and engagement. And of course, always um, working with the regulatory agencies as early as possible to make sure we have those streamlined permitting processes in place. We um, work closely with the kind of the cutting the green tape initiative that the resources agency is, is implementing to see how we can also be as efficient as possible. Um, I think you know that we do fund somebody that works at the State Water Resources Control Board right now. And another thing we could do is potentially get some additional in-house expertise to help us again, just get through those types of processes. And then we wanna just continue you know, funding a lot of the activities that we've started, right? So we've done a lot of planning um, that has yet to go to implementation. So we wanna be in a position then to take those planning projects to the implementation phase as quickly as possible. Um, there's also potentially some expedited permitting um, options. I think you, you may have heard that um, there's an expedited CEQA compliance process that may be an option for some projects. It's kind of in the early stages but we're working very closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to see if that's an opportunity for some of our projects as well. And then, um, as I mentioned, yeah, just early consultation with regulatory agencies is gonna help us move forward. So um, our vision for the next five years is we've got a lot to do and we're of course interested and excited to work, continue to work with you and other partners on this. You guys are the ones you know, out on the ground getting it done. So we wanna just figure out how to work with you to identify the highest priorities and really just get that work underway. And so we're gonna be really looking again to you know, investing in those prior investments that includes continuing the science, that includes learning from all the science that's been happening and having that help us prioritize the best actions beyond uh, you know, the next steps for folks to be um, implementing. And then, yeah, and then, walk, and then working with you kind of on a more, um, regular and consistent basis, you know, where we can kind of get out of the, the solicitation process that was more structured and get into a more continuous process where we can actually help develop projects along the way. I think I'll leave it at that. Oh, that's fantastic. That was really interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, also, I'm, I'm feeling like we should have given you all more than five minutes because we're like packing it in, but really appreciate that. Um, all right, we're gonna move over to Derek. Derek, are you ready? Yeah, coming through on the audio there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, you know, what do I think some of the biggest challenge and I'm gonna talk generically about restoration, but you know, flow is definitely a big part of that. But um, I think one of the biggest challenges is, um, I'm gonna step off the deep end here. Uh, folks in our society, and I mean the general public, not just us, need to feel more secure in themselves and at their homes. They need to be able to feel secure enough to take time out of their days to care about endangered species and salmonids. And I think about the last 20 years personally, um, materially, I'm much more secure than I was 20 years ago, but I don't feel more secure than I did 20 years ago. And I don't think I'm unique in that. And I think if we can change that broadly, um, we can garner a lot more support for restoration. And one of the biggest challenges that we need for restoration is support for more funding. Um, we've gotten lots of funding recently, actually kind of unprecedented amounts. Um, but those have primarily been from federal grant sources and bonds that have been passed in the legislature and by the voters in the state. And those bonds, while they are very large numbers and they are doing a lot of good work on the landscape, they're not a long-term funding source. They will expire. Um, they are a loan and that loan 
you know, will be have to be repaid uh, over the long future. And so I think that we have a need for dedicated local funding uh, for restoration and for monitoring, um, as this group has shown, um, the truly amazing things you can do when you have, I won't say unencumbered, but less encumbered funding sources that allow you the latitude to ask questions and do science and come up with answers. Um, it's really amazing. Um, what can uh, we do at the Department of Fish and Wildlife to be more effective? Um, at the Department of Fish and Wildlife, I believe that we currently are very effective through our grants programs at taking grant monies and distributing them through our programs out into the restoration community and getting some restoration done. I think we've got a really great uh, we've got a wonderful mechanism that, that works really well. Uh, the problem is, is that demand is outstripping supply. So going back to our first question, what do, what do I think we need to do? I think we need to expand the funding that's available for these grant programs. Um, I don't necessarily think that we need new grant programs, although we could be better served by maybe some uh, specialized funding source that I haven't thought of yet, but I think increasing the funding available to the grant programs that we already have to get closer to meeting the demand uh, that's out there for recovery and restoration works is really important. Um, one thing that um, the grant community can do is expand the scale of their projects. Um, this project has shown, as have other ones, that we are doing a really great job at demonstrating that these projects work. We know that um, uh, water, I wanna say recovery, I'm blanking on the title right here. Um, water conservation, sorry, water conservation projects, they work. We understand that they work, but they need to be implemented on a scale uh, that can be effective in the watershed. And this project has given us some insight into what that minimum scale might be. Um, and quite frankly, the scale that's needed is probably gonna exceed uh, the capacity, uh, well, certainly will exceed the capacity of single grant sources. And you're gonna have to figure out a way to phase these larger projects um, so that they are not distorting uh, to the funding sources that are available. So we'll have to be more clever, more thoughtful about how we create projects uh, describe them as a whole and demonstrate we have a plan for phasing these in over the long term, um, rather than, you know, we're, we're past the days of um, doing demonstration projects for water conservation, but we need to, we need to do the whole neighborhood um, now instead of just getting one volunteer to go. Um, in terms of agency actions, you know, what is our vision for the next five years? Uh, the resources agency and the department have worked together on the cutting the green tape initiative. Um, we have created some new permit um, processes. We have streamlined some old ones, created some new ones and worked on creating some exemptions for restoration work. Um, I think those will be very beneficial to the restoration community. Um, and we have in the department focused um, through the Cutting the Green Tape program uh, funding, uh, new funding, and we have done that by implementing a new grant program. And this has been viewed, this program has been viewed by the department as kind of a, uh, a sandbox or an incubator where we can uh, try out and experiment with um, new ideas on how to run a grant program, uh, how to administer one. And so those are the things that the department is, that's the new, those are the new things over the next five years that um, we'll be bringing to the restoration community. Very cool, thank you, Derek. I like the phasing and the grant program incubator idea. Um, all right, thanks, Derek. Um, I'm gonna, let me see who's next. Joe, are you ready, Joe? Yeah, okay. yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. You know, I think one of the biggest, obviously one of the biggest challenges for, and I work more in the funding realm, um, 
for some of the groups is working in rural residential neighborhoods, um, which are basically um, every single one of our creeks pretty much has a road going up it with many homes and everything. So it's much more difficult working in rural residential neighborhoods than it is in forested landscapes and stuff. And so a lot of groups applying for funding have a lot of trouble, you know, as many in this group do with getting cost share for projects. So, and that's no different from stream flow projects to large wood and everything else. So that's, that's very difficult. Um, one of the big problems I see in the Russian too is the, it has to do with capacity of just actual people to apply for grants. So, you know, on the Russian, I know Derek and I, you know, we, we hound kind of some of the same people on the Russian a lot, you know, so it's, there's a big capacity problem, I think, in the Russian River. Um, we have 20 plus coho streams, you know, and I know this group has, and other groups, you know, we need to kind of reduce the amount of streams that we work on to be much more effective, you know, so us as agency folks really need to come together and talk with you guys about how to increase capacity of just people to turn in and write grants. So I, I, I think that's, we're, we're not seeing enough, you know, for the Russian River. I, I really think um, Russian River, you know, should be seeing a lot more grant funding, you know, comparatively on coastal California. Um, the other real big challenge of, of completing flow restoration work is say at pace and scale is just the nature of just how bad some of the Russian River streams are in terms of being incised. So, you know, even I was, I was in Upper Willow Creek last week and, you know, you look up and it's just great. You're way away from houses and everything, but you're still 15 feet deep in a, in the Creek where, from where it should be, you know what I mean? So that's, that's a difficult thing to restore flow in these, in these streams being how, just how bad, I think, I don't think everybody realized just how bad some of the habitat in some of these creeks are. So um, anyways, that kind of leads me into the, 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 question two, um, how, how can flow restoration be much more effective? And it really gets to, you know, stuff I've learned from folks that are, that are, you know, after a decade of working on this stuff, you know, that, that are in your partnership with Brock and John Green and stuff. And it's flow restoration is much more than just storage and everything, you know, storage and say, uh, you know, infiltration gallery type projects and stuff, but, you know, large wood, um, you know, I saw some really, you know, Derek and I went out with John Green and looked at, you know, some upper Salmon Creek trips, which arresting huge head cuts and stuff that are way above anatomy. So finding ways to get that kind of work, you know, which is also flow restoration and stuff. So um, anyways, I mean, I get to the third question. I, I guess I'll, I'll replace that with my kind of vision uh, for the next five years for the Russian River is really to, for the Russian River, to find a way for it to garner much more restoration dollars um, and get it up on the, in the scale of say Mendocino County or Humboldt County and stuff like that, really increase, finding a way to increase the capacity and to get much more restoration dollars going into the Russian River. Um, we have a well-funded broodstock program, which is super unique and we're super fortunate. You know, I, I definitely witnessed with Marishka, the early almost extinction of coho in the Russian River. And now we're seeing 600 plus fish come back. Yeah, but I really think if we want to keep that sustainable and move up to a next level of actually seeing a thousand plus fish come back and stuff and realize some of the potential the Russian River has, we really need to increase the scale of restoration in the Russian River. And so I'd really like to start you know, meeting much more regularly with you guys to figure out how can we keep elements of this partnership going through all of this money that's coming. So there's a lot of smart people um, in the room and I just, I wouldn't want this effort to kind of end just because, you know, one entity who's put in 10 years of funding with it is, is maybe coming to an end, but there's so much money coming. That I, I would love to figure out a way to kind of keep some elements of this going and to help out maybe if it has to be individual groups, help individual groups with capacity to keep going. So anyways, I tried to be real short, so. Awesome, thank you, Joe, really appreciate it. Um, John, I see you have your hand up, but we're gonna hold the questions to the end so everybody has a chance to go and then we'll circle back if we have time, hope that's okay. Um, all right, Rick, are you ready? Rick, are you there? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, 
thank you uh, for the opportunity to chat with everyone here and share my ideas. Uh, but I have to admit, I'm probably going to be a little short, uh, shorter than the five minutes, just because someone uh, stole a lot of my topics earlier. Thank you, Brian. Uh, but, you know, we've been working with Brian uh, and other state water board staff recently uh, and CDF&W. And just to echo what Brian said, I think one of the real critical needs is we need to have flow studies. Um, if we're going to try to make changes and to try to get flows back into creeks, uh, we have to answer that question of how much flow do the fish need? And, you know, that question is not just, um, you know, during drought periods of trying to keep the fish alive um, and, and reduce mass mortality events, but we need to be looking forward to potential recovery actions and how do we recover these fish? Um, so, you know, we've been working with the other resource agencies trying to answer these questions, uh, specifically, like I mentioned, for drought planning. Uh, but there's other um, areas that we, we need to answer those questions. And one that comes to mind is um, through the SIGMA process. And that's the, uh, you know, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We have three groundwater basins within Sonoma County that are all going to be trying to avoid the impacts of groundwater pumping on uh, depleting surface water flows. So that's another uh, venue where, you know, people are going to be asking like, okay, what do the fish need? Um, and, you know, we really need to tackle that issue, that, that those types of questions. Um, it gives me hope that, you know, recently the California environmental flow framework uh, was developed, which I think has a lot of promise for uh, the future in allowing kind of citizen scientists and uh, local stakeholders to to basically follow that framework and to and to come and get the answers to a lot of these these flow questions. So um, another thing that I think that we need uh, we need more groundwater surface water investigations. And I know that, you know, Matt O'Connor and others are developing groundwater surface water models as all of the, uh, the Sigma basins will also be developing those, but it's just so critical in our area where, you know, 90%, 100% of our summer base flow is groundwater accretion to the stream channel. Um, if we don't have that type of information, it's very hard to look to just surface water diverters to try to manage that type of problem. So let me, um, let me jump to uh, how we can help as an agency. So you heard right before me from Joe um, and you know Joe's uh, no restoration center is really the one with the restoration funding um, I work in the ESA permitting so I can't really um, you know give out funds or things like that but what I can do and what I've been trying to do is to make the the ESA permitting process uh, more streamlined and more effective. And we've done that with a couple of um, projects. One is this flow augmentation safe harbor agreement uh, for people that, um, that I've been chatting with in the past about this, you know that it's been uh, a while coming. Um, I was hoping to have that done last summer, but basically what it's gonna do is it's, it's going to allow landowners um, programmatically up and down the uh, coast of California to implement these um, 
these flow augmentation projects, such as like we have out in Green Valley Creek and on Porter Creek, uh, using off-channel um, uh, flow or off-channel water sources that can actually be um, channeled into the stream channel during low flow periods to, to help uh, fish survival. Um, I'm hoping that that's going to be available for this summer. Um, hopefully we, we, we won't have a very serious drought um, or a continuation of the drought, but if we do, hopefully that will be in place. Uh, another um, option that we're going to be working on is a programmatic safe harbor agreement for a floodplain re-engagement. Uh, for a lot of these uh, groundwater sustainability agencies under Sigma that are thinking about trying to recharge groundwater, they're actually looking at uh, off-channel infiltration ponds. What we want to do is we want to encourage re-engaging floodplains so we actually get floodplain recharge. Um, not only does that recharge groundwater, but it also creates overwinter habitat uh, for salmon and steelhead. So um, hopefully that's going to be worked on uh, coming up quick. And um, I think I will leave it there. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate it. Apparently Brian didn't steal all of your ideas. Because they're uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, um, and then Dan. Um, last but not least, I'm gonna kick it over to you. All right, thank you. So Dan Schultz with uh, State Water Board Division of Water Rights, Program Manager, um, and I cheated a little bit um, and put together a quick slide deck. Um, if I could just share my screen super quick here, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, do you have a green screen share button? I do. So does everybody, now Now comes the tricky part, assuming you can see that. We can. Do you see the actual presentation now? It's still in PowerPoint, but, yeah. Like it hasn't okay. gone to, it hasn't gone to the. Ah, didn't do presentation. The full screen view. button. Hold on one second. That one work? That one's in presenter mode. Yeah. See, you know, I get good at one platform and Teams, and then the other one doesn't work. I hear you. All right, hold on one second. I'll just, I'll share it differently. Okay. I was going to say, if you go back to that, and once you're in presenter mode and click on display options, the little drop down, you can switch which screen is presenter and which screen is your notes. Ah. Okay, let's try that again then. Share. And then from the beginning. And then work display setting. All right, did that one work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there was my five minutes. So um, I hope I hope that was worthwhile. Um, so anyhow, I wanted to put together a, a quick presentation because I thought that some of, especially number one, you know, the first question of, of really getting at the biggest challenges was kind of going back a little bit to some data we collected as part of one of the State Water Board's prior efforts during 2015 as part of the Russian River Emergency Regulation. Um, and so just quick background on this, it applied to four priority Russian River tributaries, Dutch Bill, Green Valley, Mark West, and Mill Creek. Um, as far as Mark West, it didn't apply to the center of the plains portion, but the rest of Mark West Creek. And there are two components in that regulation. There was enhanced conservation measures, which applied to what we consider the critical areas of those watersheds, and then also an information order that was statewide. And so for this, I just wanted to, to kind of focus on some of the results from the information order, because I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to see some of these results, especially in the graph, in, in these graphics, and, and it's really kind of illustrate some of the challenges in the watershed. So in all of these slides, they're all set up pretty much the exact same. Um, the one on the top right, the blue circles show uh, groundwater well diversion points and the green triangles show the uh, surface water diversion points. And basically we sent 
the information order to all landowners within these watersheds, and they needed to identify their water source, uh, the amount of water they use, what they use the water for, and a number of other different, um, different items. Uh, the map on the bottom left shows it more by um, water use and the amount that's used. So the different colors uh, represent different water beneficial uses of water. So green is ag, blue is domestic, red is ag and domestic, uh, purple is municipal only, and then yellow is all, all other. The size of the circle indicates more water use than less water use. So the smaller is, is little water use, bigger circles, more water use. So since I only have five minutes, I'm going to go through these really quick. I can drop a link in the chat where we have a more detailed presentation posted online um, that, that you can go through and, and kind of explore this information in more detail. Um, but this is just a snapshot of Dutch Bill Creek. Um, and this is a snapshot of Green Valley Creek, which is probably my favorite because it's just the biggest scattershot of water diversions of, of all four tributaries. And, and when we start to look at something like Green Valley Creek, you know, this is where you really start to see the complexity of the issues and the challenges of trying to enhance flows in these in these watersheds of just the the distributed diversions, the large mix of domestic versus, um, versus other agriculture and other uses. Um, and honestly, the sheer number of, um, of groundwater diversions for surface water diversions, um, which are a little bit more challenging to to regulate. And then this is a similar shot of Mark West Creek. Um, I should have mentioned in the other ones that the little yellow highlighted area that you see in the, in the upper right portion is considered the critical area, which is the area where um, that was deemed as the most important portions of the watershed for summer um, juvenile rearing. Um, and so you see a similar pattern here in Mark West, and then this is Mill Creek watershed. Um, so also just wanted to put this, you know, some other graphics up here. This is just the percent of, of points of diversion by, um, by beneficial use. Uh, so this just kind of gives you some snapshots of, of you know, the scattered diversion points we saw in those graphics and the percent of, of which of those diversion points is for what type of water. So as you can see in most of these watersheds, the primary, the primary points of diversion are related to domestic um, use in, these, in the watershed. And then as we look at this next slide, which is just um, looking more at by the volume of water diverted by beneficial use, um, there's a little bit more of an even signature between uh, the domestic use and, and other uses in most of the watersheds with the exception of Mill Creek. So why I kind of bring that up? Oh, and I have some more, sorry. I got put more up here. Um, these are just kind of stack bar charts by month that kind of show the patterns of, of diversion and use in the different watersheds. So this is Dutch Bill. Um, it, it has the, the beneficial uses broken out. And, and Green Valley, as you see a larger signature kind of right through the summer, more typical. Um, same with Mark West Creek. And then here is Mill Creek, just kind of to give that, that kind of pattern to everybody. Um, so why I wanted to move through that is because I think that really kind of helps demonstrate some of the challenges that, that you know, as a, reg as, a regulate, as a regulator we face, but also just as community members and, and other uh, folks that are, are working to, to do uh, flow enhancement in these tributaries. So as far as some of the challenges that I, that I put together for completing flow restoration work, um, the first kind of obvious one is, is these are tributaries that have that just naturally experience lower flows and periods of intermittent sea, um, in particular in the lower reaches. So we are dealing with, we're, we're starting from a, from a standpoint of, a, of stream systems that, that don't have a lot of flow to begin with. Um, another challenge that, that the information order displayed is that you know, there are significant impacts occurring not just from surface water, but also from the groundwater diversions and in in Mark West and Green Valley in particular, I'd say it's dominated by groundwater diversions more so than surface water diversions. <clears throat> and so that's, again, it, it takes more, um, more, uh, more analysis and, and it's a little bit more difficult to tease out what those groundwater impacts are, when they're occurring, how to mitigate for those um, in these watersheds than just a simple surface water one-to-one -one relationship of, of water being taken out. Um, another another challenge is that you know as as you can see there it's it's an agriculture and domestic water use are are really the 
the sources that are depleting the surface water flows. And as especially if we look at those critical rearing areas up in the upper watersheds, um, you you even see it shifts more towards domestic use than agriculture use because a large a lot of the larger vineyards are actually located where there's sustainable groundwater diversions um, down in the lower portions of those watersheds and not as much in what starts to become more fractured rock as you go higher up. Um, and then just the the large number of smaller dispersed diversions. Um, you know, there's not it's not really looking at how do we how do we offset a couple large diversions. Um, to, to Im improve the flows and, and we can kind of get rid of the noise of all the small ones in a lot of these watersheds. It's, it's, the, it's a cumulative issue of all the diversions that are really causing some of the issues in in-stream flows. And then the last one, which, which everybody pretty much touched on already, is just the lack of information on the minimum flows needed to support some on a migration and rearing. And then I also added it as well, the impacts of the trade-off between different water management alternatives of you know, there's there's the flow criteria component, which is what do the fish need um, to kind of, you know, as part, as more of an optimization type analysis. And then there's kind of the trade-offs between fisheries needs and other beneficial uses of water and how do we balance those different uses. So for recommendations, and these are my recommendations, um, I, I came up with a few here and, and one is, is just kind of continuing this ongoing conversation regarding education and outreach on the cumulative impacts of surface water and groundwater diversions on in-stream flows. And, you know, and, and it's also trying to frame that discussion that we have data to show that, you know, it's a community water issue and it's, it's not just an issue that's related to agriculture, not just domestic or, or businesses. That, that are causing the problem. It's, it's kind of the, the, the overall use of water. And why I kind of call that one out specifically is when we did a lot of outreach for the 2015 emergency regulations, there was a lot of finger pointing. The domestic users pointed to the ag as the problem and pointed to um, businesses, especially the tasting rooms and stuff like that going in that were causing the problem with, with the water supply. Agriculture looked at domestic and said, we've been implementing for years all of these water conservation, you know, efforts to reduce our water use and it's not happening on the domestic side. So it was a lot of different, you know, it's kind of that concept where everybody else is to blame and it's not, it's not me. And so that needs to be changed a little bit so that everybody's in this together and we need to work out a community solution, not just, not just um, point at other people and tell them they need to do something. Um, and then, and then of course, um, you know, continuing efforts to to um, encourage and improve water conservation and storage throughout the watersheds. Uh, another recommendation is just con to continue to support and help build out um, NIMS's and CDFW's voluntary drought initiative program. Um, and and in particular, what we saw in 2015, and even I I don't really have the the data in 2019. Um, or 2020, but some of the um, flow augmentation projects may have been really what, what kind of got some of the salmon at least through that summer rearing period dur during the times of drought. And when we look at the dispersed diversions, and even if we did have a flow requirement trying to implement that and enforce against that in these watersheds also becomes difficult during these low flows. Um, and so flow augmentation may actually be the best, the best um, approach to maintaining these, the in-stream flows that the fish need during these during the drier years. Um, and then the last recommendation just broadly is to develop in-stream flow criteria and minimum flow targets through local efforts and priority tributaries throughout the Russian River. And I phrase this one in particular as non-regulatory. Um, and I phrase it as that because you know often it's it's looked at the state to develop and water boards to develop those flow requirements, but I think there's a lot of value to starting that effort as well at the local level and starting to work through that, trying to get some grant funds to help develop that information. Because we, we do have limited resources and our resources are currently assigned to certain watersheds and certain efforts. Um, and even if there's not a, a um, regulatory um, establishment of those flow requirements, that information can still prove very valuable to, to help inform local water management decisions to help support the BDI program and also to, to kind of 
pat around for education and outreach for to get um, better conservation at the at the individual scale. And then my last slide here is just is just um, looking at division. I, I kind of narrowed it in onto divisional water rights, next steps, and coastal tributaries, and I split it between short term and long term. Our short term uh, efforts and steps are just our continued implementation of the Russian River Emergency Regulation regulation that's currently in place. Um, and other emergency regulations throughout the state as, as the drought continues and it continues. Um, and granted, the, the Russian River reg, it only applies to curtailment of surface water diversions, and it doesn't include um, components of minimum in-stream flows or groundwater um, diversions or curtailments within it. It does start to build the conversation along, along the lines of, of what is needed and does provide for um, human health and safety needs, as well as um, as in-stream flow needs along the main stem of the Russian River. And then also um, continue to help support NIMS and CDFW's VDI program. Uh, looking over the longer term, uh, we have a couple different efforts in the um, flow development realm. Um, the first one is the California Water Action Plan, which is an effort to enhance streams and stream flows in five priority tributaries throughout the state in collaboration with CDFW. And um, this one in particular hits home in the Russian because one of the five tributaries that was selected is Mark West Creek. Um, other coastal tributaries are the South Fork Eel, uh, Shasta River, and Ventura River, and then in the Delta there's Mill Creek Watershed Tributary in Sacramento. And then also another effort that um, that is starting to get ramped up and underway is development of long-term regional flow requirements for cannabis cultivation, water diversions. These flow requirements would only apply to cannabis cultivation. However, um, in some of these coastal tributaries, especially in, in some of the um, headwater areas, uh, cannabis cultivation is a significant impact that that flow requirements could help uh, to release some of the stress on the fisheries. Although it's, it's a complicated issue with the legal versus legal cultivation um, components, but, um, but I thought I'd mention that as well. And that was what I threw together. Thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate it. And I wanna just give a huge thanks to all of our panelists. Um, we really appreciate um, you being willing to participate and also the thought and effort and energy that you put in to what you presented. So um, big thank you from all of us. And also I wanted to just note, John, We hopefully we didn't skip you, but I saw that you put in the chat about solicitations. Does that cover it? Are we good? Yeah, that, that kind of covers it. I just kind of wanted to plug our program. We recently had a uh, cutting the green tape solicitation that went out and all those applications are being reviewed. Derek Acom uh, mentioned that, but uh, next week we're hoping all things going good. Uh, we should release the, the next Prop 1 uh, grant uh, solicitation and open the application. Um, that'll be out for about six weeks, probably the first week of March it'll close. Uh, so definitely give that a look. The, um, uh, the links are there in the chat. And also uh, we're kind of starting a new thing uh, with the program, we kind of piloted it with the uh, cutting the green tape solicitation where we prior to and now all year long, if there's not a a solicitation that's open or an application that's open. Um, we have a, a form that you can uh, fill out and request uh, consultation with the grants branch to kind of um, kind of review your your project before you submit it for application. And that's where we kind of talk about you know how your pro how your project fits fits in with our program and and maybe how you can make your project a little more competitive. Uh, during the application process. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. All right. I'm going to send it back to Sarah. Take us home. Thank you, everybody. I, I, too, really, really appreciate these important contributions to this really important conversation. I'd like to keep having these conversations. It's really encouraging to hear um, some of the positive ways you're all working towards change. And I think um, we should have like an annual check in or something, hopefully not on Zoom next time. But yeah, my head is kind of swimming. So many compelling thoughts, but also just reminders that we have some really incredibly 
complex issues to tackle. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes and wrap it up. If anybody needs to jump off the call, it's a little bit after four. So we totally understand. And thank you for being here today. Um, you know, obviously, years of hard work by the partnership and many others here today have led to some tangible flow improvements in our Russian River coho streams. But nonetheless, we are all clearly on the same page that there's a ton of work that needs to be done. And I'm not saying this because you don't already know this. I'm saying this just to kind of keep burrs in our saddles that really there's simply no doubt in my mind that stream flow has to be significantly improved if we're gonna have a fighting chance of saving our salmon and steelhead in the face of this increase in water scarcity that we're observing right before our eyes. Um, we really can't afford to lose the momentum that we've gained. And to the contrary, we really need to find a way to kind of take it to the next level. And I know you've heard this many times today as well, but really just kind of moving forward as a community, we want to increase the scale, the pace, the scope of our efforts. We need to continue the work being done to you know, address these diversions, but also expand it to a watershed scale, really build on that work and engage in more concerted efforts to restore hydrologic and ecosystem functions, right? And that's gonna require really long-term dedication stable, flexible funding sources, supportive policies, you know, compelling incentives. And really it's gonna require all of us on this call today, taking action, maintaining collaboration, coordination, communication, getting super creative, right? Stepping out of our boxes and finding ways to kind of break down these barriers and overcome these hurdles. Like, we feel that we've built a really solid foundation here in the Russian River. And I think the partnership has contributed a useful framework for improving stream flow. Um, and that's really just a foundation for us to like move forward from and everybody here has contributed in their own way. So, um, you know, I'm encouraged to know that all of us share the same goals um, because the task of achieving flow restoration and local salmonid recovery falls to us, right? So we just need to stick together to find ways to do that work faster, bigger, and better than we've been doing it to achieve these goals. And we also, you know, I have to say, hope that you will keep us in mind as a partnership if any appropriate kind of funding opportunities come your way. We always really appreciate that. So um, really just in closing, I want to say that we recognize that Recovering our salmon and our freshwater resources, if we're able to do that, it's just a Herculean task. It's going to take a village, more than a village. It's going to take a planet. It's definitely going to take every one of us here. And, you know, I speak on behalf of the entire partnership when I just say that we are incredibly grateful to be part of such an amazing, dedicated, and supportive community. So thank you for supporting us over this past decade plus, and also thank you for joining us today.